Okay, we'd like to welcome everyone to council meeting this evening. All council members are present. Um, we will ask Kimball Ray from the Den for 832 Biblos Den, 832 to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and then Councilwoman Diana Anderson will offer it in the opening prayer. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the opportunity that we have to gather together as citizens of Pleasant Grove. We're great, very grateful for our town. We're grateful for all the citizens that live here. We're grateful for this chance that, to talk about issues and come to resolutions and compromises that are best for Pleasant Grove. We pray that we will be inspired, that we will be able to listen and learn and then serve each other. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kimball. Okay. Do we have any changes to tonight's agenda? I show an amended agenda on my uh, yeah. Anything else? Council? Um, then I'll, I'll call for an approval on the agenda. I make the motion that we approve the agenda as written. The amended agenda as written. I'll second that. We have a motion by Ben and a second by Eric. All in favor? Aye. All right. Any votes? All right. So we'll have an open session now. If there's nothing, if there's not a uh, public hearing on the item that you wanted to talk about, or if there's nothing on the agenda that, that you wanted to talk about, you're welcome to. Come up to the podium here and state your name and address, and that's for the record. And then we'll go ahead and hear you. Blaine Thatcher, 120 North, 1400 East. I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to address the citizens of Pleasant Grove. And I'd like to express a few thoughts and um, what I believe is a message of hope for our city. <clears throat> this election is over, and it has been a classic race in historic terms. Two obviously opposing views of the correct course of action for our city. The city back team running on their record and the challengers calling for change. The only thing left now is to verify the election results. By all current indications, it looks like the citizens have elected the city back team. Our former public works director and two sitting council members. To each of you, I concede the victory. I truly believe that this was the opportunity to change the spending pattern of our city. I believe this was the chance to correct the course, solve our obvious problems, and do it without raising taxes. Citizens, you have spoken, and by the smallest of margins, selected to stay on the current course. I accept that. I do not like it, but I accept it. I do not believe it is the wise course, and I do not believe it is responsible but I accept it as the choice of the citizens. We are a deeply divided city, and we must now find a way to move forward with the newly elected council. I will work with anyone, whether we agree or disagree, either generally or specifically. I will support our council as they thoughtfully assess verifiable data and information 
that leads to good and right principled based decisions. However, I will not support and will actively oppose our council if they make decisions that are not responsible and not based on verifiable data. <clears throat> I strongly encourage all of our elected officials, whether newly elected or previously elected, and our administrators to fulfill your duty with fidelity to ensure that the tax dollars of our citizens are used as efficiently as possible. I strongly encourage all of our elected officials and all our city employees to embrace the concept of becoming the low cost provider of city services. If we in Pleasant Grove can achieve becoming the low cost provider of city services, the divide in this city will disappear. The citizens will find great satisfaction in a wonderful city run as efficiently as possible and will be unbelievably supportive of the employees in providing cost efficient services for their benefit. <clears throat> the divide has been much discussed in Pleasant Grove. Many ascribe the cause to people having a difference of opinions and expressing those opinions in either a calm or a passionate manner. I believe this to be incorrect. Having and expressing differing opinions is not the cause of the divide in our city. <clears throat> the cause of the divide is not being honest with the citizens not operating as efficiently as possible, not fixing our roads, the high, uh, proposing exorbitantly high cost solutions to our public safety needs, and of course, pushing the largest tax increase in the history of Pleasant Grove on the taxpayers without a vote. If you want to eliminate the divide in Pleasant Grove, you need to stop doing the things that cause the divide. Don't try to stop the discussion and expression of differing ideas. Those are the manifestation of the problem and not the cause. In order to bridge the divide, our elected officials and our administrators must be able to listen to and engage in the debate of differing ideas with the citizens. <clears throat> Only through the civil discourse of differing ideas can we find the most prudent solutions to our problems. Solutions that are in the best interest of our citizens and solutions that protect our liberty. This is my message of hope for our city. This is the vision that I believe can unite the citizens in maintaining our wonderful city with the efficient use of our tax dollars. <clears throat> our tax dollars and the protection of our liberty are the sacred trust that you, our elected officials, have been entrusted with. As elected officials and as our, our administrators have been entrusted with this, please treat it as such. Please represent us and protect our liberty. I thank you. Kathy Cresser, I don't have a gold, but I have these for you because you went through hell for the election. And I only know a few of the things you went through, but I appreciate the time and the effort it took for you to do whatever you did that week or that day. Or incredible, huh? Or continuing. Continuing. Just incredible, the amount of work that she goes through. That's my happy note. My sad note, can somebody please clean the bathrooms at the rec center?
I'm taking it to council. <laughs> All I'm gonna say. <laughs> oh, sorry, Dion. I would have if I had known it was you. I would have talked to you in private. They're so bad. Dion, make her bring you some candy too. I'll, I, I'll take Dion whatever it takes. I'll even come scrub them. <laughs> if you'll let me bring my own chemicals. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I'm Ryan Schooley. I live at uh, 1734 Blackhawk Drive. Um, and uh, I, um, perhaps not as, as, as eloquent as, as was said before, but I, I have a, a real dissatisfaction with the, the, the current trajectory of the city. Um, I, I don't think I'm alone in that. You know, I mean, there, there's a lot of, of that that's been voiced in the past. Um, I was at the store yesterday talking with a guy who, who worked at Walmart and, and, he, and he worked at, uh, he said he worked for an asphalt company during the summer. Um, and he, and he, he said that Pleasant Grove roads uh, were, were literally the kind of the joke of the company, uh, you know, and, and for me, it was kind of, you know, trying to sort of reconcile this this notion of having the, the worst roads in the state. And, and yet, you know, we have a, a plans or at least proposals to, to build a you know $20 million public safety building. Um, I don't deny that there's a, a, a need for, for public safety building. Um, but, you know, I, I believe we have a sister city that, that <laughs> was able to accomplish that goal in the neighborhood of a couple million dollars. Um, and and I I just wanted to come and, and express a, a bit of my frustration, but just to um, I guess express to you my understanding of your role as a council, um, and, and that is fundamentally to take the funds that have been entrusted with you, or the budgets that are proposed to you, and to scrutinize them, and to you know look over every dime that that's that's going through that that's getting your approval okay you you represent us as citizens you know and um you know i happen to be an attorney you know we owe a duty of loyalty to our clients that means that their interests come before anything else before my interests before those of my family before those of uh, you know anyone else um and and i believe that this council's duty in, in terms of uh the, the, the finances of our city is very much similar. Um, I, I've heard it said that, you know, the budgets are too long to read. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if that was said or not, but I just want to encourage you as much as I can to uh, scrutinize the, the dollars that are being spent because there's no, there's no reason why a city such as ours shouldn't be able to operate efficiently and, and have proper roads. Um, incidentally, I have a car. I was driving down the road two, three days ago and I hit a pothole and it cracked my wheel. I have low profile wheels on my car. Um, and I was already kind of frustrated and, and that kind of just brought my, my level of frustration almost to a level of anger. Um, and so I just want to come and, and ask you, plead with you, please to to think about the things that come across your desk, think about the proposals that come and, and scrutinize the dollars that are spent because they're real people money. Uh, you know, I mean, governments don't produce money. People produce it. And it's your job to, to ensure that that money gets spent in an effective manner and, and in the best interest of all of the citizens of Pleasant Grove, not, you know, not the mayor, not you know, city employees, but every citizen uh, of the city. I've lived here for a short time, probably relative to you. I've lived here for three years. Uh, you know, right now my wife and I rent. We're planning on buying. And I, I, I love the area that I live in. And I love the people I've met. Ben Stanley is, is one of my, my great friends. Going to be a friend for life. But the problem is my, my wife and I are considering not living here um, because of the status of, of the city. And that's a shame because it's a great place. I've been told by a friend that, you know, they're putting their house on the market because the way the city has been managed. So I know there's a lot of frustration out there. And I just ask you to do all that you can to fix the problems in an efficient manner. 
Um, I know it can be done. Thank you. Mike Wisland, 1636 East, 400 South. Um, I would also like to um, deplore the council members to be as transparent as possible in their votings on issues for which they've received funding from their campaigns. Um, this is a bit of a concern to me as I see almost a kind of buyout scenario going on here with St. John's. I'd first like to compliment the city council on their decision to not go forward <coughs> with a development that they felt did not meet their visual requirements uh, to make the city a pretty place to be. So my compliments go out to you on those decisions that are tough to do. My concern is that St. John's, um, based in Baltimore, Maryland, um, has decided to build buildings in our city. Um, a concerned citizen has written an email, perhaps to some of you, about um, the amount of money that would be received by the city for taxes, which, of course, we are all for. I want to encourage you all, though, um, to make sure that you are voting in an honest and unbiased manner, because I know that the three council members that were elected, your largest contributor was St. John's Corporation. <coughs> Is that incorrect? I have yours in front of me right here. And that is correct. So I'm asking you, is this, and I'm asking the mayor, is this going to be an objective vote? Yeah, I think as you can see from the last time we met, it was objective. Okay, I'm just asking that to be continued, and I compliment your standing up for the city's beauty. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council on open session? Would anyone else like to come up and be mayor? <laughs> <laughs> Seeing none, we'll close the open session and move on to the consent items. Um, it's just city council minutes. Are there any? Pardon? There aren't any minutes, actually. I'm out of okay. So I should be moving on this one. Sorry. <coughs> Actually, yeah. so, so scratch that. Thank you. So we'll skip the consent items, but there aren't any. And we'll go to item number seven, which are uh, board and commissions, and there's nothing there, but we do have. Is Glennis Carter here? Okay. Glennis, you have a presentation for us tonight about the Utah Valley Women Initiative Program. Okay, I'm just going to read our thing so I don't sure. miss any of the good points. Um, we are starting Utah Valley Women. Um, at the launch of the new organization, Utah Valley Women, on October 16th, at the Sarah Center for the Arts, mayors and leaders from most cities in Utah Valley and women from many cities attended. They spent the evening identifying and discussing the major problems that keep Happy Valley from being as happy as it could be for thousands of women who live here. These are the primary problems as agreed upon by the Utah Valley city leaders and women in attendance. Women believe they are not good enough, they worry about fitting in, and many, especially women who are not raising children, feel like they are alone. They do not feel fulfilled and purpose-driven. In other words, they are not actively engaged in something that they love doing on a daily basis. Uh, two is women are addicted to a variety of things, eating, not eating, um, worry, drugs, prescription and hard drugs, pornography. And number three is women are not feeling as safe as they, as they would like to feel, and they're increasingly concerned about their future <coughs> safety and security. Four is women lack healthy relationships. Some are abused. Some feel overwhelmed and confused as mothers. Some have poor relationships with husbands and or other family members, friends, or co-workers. Many single mothers, single women struggle daily, and older women are often deeply sad and lonely, and they lack um, meaningful relationships and feel passed by. The Utah Valley Women created 
the Utah Valley Women's Initiative to provide to solutions to these problems in ways that can be implemented in the short and the long term. The UVW <coughs> Initiative will officially launch on Friday, January 15th at 7.30 at the Sarah Center for the Arts. The initiative is called Utah Valley, Valley Women Celebrating Life. Um, city leaders, citizens, and UVW representatives in each of the 23 cities in Utah Valley will meet monthly for initiative discussions and solutions focused um, <coughs> and focused presentations by experts. Utah Valley women will present free, all this is free to the women, monthly, educational and uplifting events and activities for all women in Utah Valley. If you want to see what we have, you can go to utahvalleywomen.com. There are... UVW is collaborating with numerous women's services and business, businesses that support women in Utah Valley. There will be a Utah Valley Women Resource Guide published to help women connect with those who are eager to help them. We also provide educational, uplifting programs to help women in all seven areas of their lives. UVW has eight research-based proven programs that will strengthen women and families in Utah Valley. One is a mental program. It's called Believe It, Become It. This helps people understand um, the principles of agency choice. It teaches participants how to create positive changes in their lives. And physical is how to be as beautiful on the outside as you are on the inside, which would be fitness, health, um, beauty. We have experts in those fields to come and talk to women. Emotional, your emotional, your healthy emotional IQ. This program teaches women how to create and enjoy emotional <coughs> well-being. Live Without Fear Training. This program teaches women exactly what to do to protect themselves and their families from break-ins, etc. It also teaches them what to do in emergencies and how to prepare for possible future disasters. And then in social, we have Women Celebrating Life. Um, we have two divisions. We're going to have 18 to 39 and then 40 and above because usually the above, we, we're done raising our children and we like to meet with women that has things in common for all of us. So... That is basically it, and what we are asking, um, we also have spiritual, financial, and, and relational. We, we, yeah. <laughs> basically, what we're asking is that um, maybe the city council can provide a room, you know, for like about 10 women once a month to meet in and to, um, you know, we'll, we get some women up the city. We're going to go to all 23 cities and have, like, each one will have their own personal website, like, Utah Valley Women, Pleasant Grove. And the other thing is, um, I think that's it. <laughs> and oh, that was it. The other thing was too, to see how we could promote this, what what you feel would be the best way to promote this through your city. A uh, couple of questions for you, Dennis. Mm -hmm. um, it's Apollo Farmhouse. Yes. She's organizing, right? She is the co she's famous, the founder. Pretty, pretty yes. Famous within the Valley. Yes. We've known of her for decades. Well, she has the win, which is global all over the world. And then doing that, she says, well, maybe I should look into Utah Valley. I so she us. did. <laughs> right. So um, we're doing it at home. As far as a place to meet those, um, the 10 people, is this a combination of people from Pleasant Grove yes. and also from uh, This will be Pleasant Grove. Organization. Pleasant Grove and <coughs> Utah Valley women. Probably Paula or I or someone else. And then the Utah Valley women, is this uh, an organized time? Prof, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay, and then uh, is it quasi government or just totally separate? In other words, is it is it part of the county or any other government entity? No, totally separate. Separate. Yes. Okay. So um, I think that that the city would like to see you be successful mm -hmm. in this private activity. Probably the best one I can think of would be to talk to Dion Giles, who okay. takes care of our different facilities that are available oh, for okay. meetings. And we have had other people that, that uh, yeah, you want to raise your hand so that she knows. We've had other people that, from other organizations that are not part of this mm -hmm. necessarily, and they've used different facilities that are available oh, okay. for that kind of a meeting. Okay. And, and another one that uh, Diana just mentioned was perhaps the library might have something. I don't know what we mm -hmm. have in terms of meeting space besides the downstairs over for you. So, but I okay. would start with Dion and, okay. um, and kind of go from there. Thank you. Okay, okay thank, thank you, you so much for listening. So I think as far as advertising, we have the city website, we have some community pages, we have email, we can send out some ideas about Okay. Like,
Okay, so who who would I get in touch with or email? David Larson. David Larson. Okay. Yeah, and I meant to bring some of these, and I didn't, so I will drop some off with Kathy, and then you could pick them up from her. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. We're going to move on to section nine. These are action items with public discussion. The first one is item 9A, which is a public hearing to consider for adoption an ordinance 2015 44 to rezone approximately 37.9 acres from the Grove Mixed Housing Subdistrict to the Grove Commercial Sales Subdistrict on property located at a approximately 100 South, 1650 West, and approximately 1450 West State Street in the Grove Mixed Housing Subdistrict. And I think he's going to read this. Yes, um, we have misplaced our uh, remote control, so David's going to be my remote. No, that's not it. There's... You want him to say G? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <beep. laughs> okay, so yeah, this is uh, uh, an item that was suggested uh, by the city council to be looked at. So it was taken back to uh, the planning commission after a, a bit of review uh, on the staff level. And uh, last month, the planning commission reviewed this request in a public hearing and received a lot of comments. So we'll go ahead and review what that is. So basically, uh, we're just showing where the Grove Zone is. It's down in the southwest corner of the community, borders the freeway. So basically, between State Street and the freeway, it, uh, that area and through there, a lot of it uh, currently undeveloped. And uh, there is a su substantial amount of multifamily housing down there as well. Uh, go ahead, further. Okay, so this is the zoning map of the Grove Zone. Uh, it shows uh, different sub-districts and a few overlays. So the freeway is down here, and then uh, you've got Pleasant Grove Boulevard that swings up here and meets State Street, which is up along through here. You've got three zoning sub-districts or uh, areas in which different types of uses can be permitted. You've got the interchange sub-district down here by the freeway between that and North County Boulevard. Then you've got this uh, burnt orange color that uh, goes up along and through here. Uh, that's the commercial sales subdistrict. Then you've got kind of a more mauve or pink color that's in these areas, uh, which is the mixed housing subdistrict. The mixed housing subdistrict does permit a lot of types of commercial uses, but because it uh, has permitted multifamily housing, that over the years has been the uh, preferred development uh, for. Uh, those owners or developers of those properties. There are a couple of uh, overlays, one which was put into place <coughs> a few years ago uh, where the current Walmart and the apartments and the townhomes behind the apartments uh, have been developed recently. Uh, that particular overlay allowed up to 18 units to the acre for multifamily. After it was approved, the city council decided they didn't want to have that applied any longer in other areas. So that overlay is no longer available to be applied. It was taken off the books. Uh, this other uh, cross-hatched area in yellow is the area of doTERRA. It's a Grove uh, business park overlay that allowed for their specific type of uses. We also have in this corner here, a senior housing overlay a development <coughs> that's currently under construction is senior housing units. So that's the, the Grove zone. Uh, go ahead and go forward. So in the mixed housing subdistrict, the intent was that you would have a mix of single family homes, of multifamily homes, uh, twin homes and, and such, and then some commercial as well. That was kind of the intent of what was uh, brought forward in that subdistrict. This is really kind of what we've gotten. And well, I'm sorry, I think my the, the other building here was office, not to multifamily. This is representing multifamily here. So this is we have hardly any, but maybe some of the other uses, but by and large, it's multifamily. So we have some uh, vacant properties in the uh, areas of the mixed housing subdistrict that have been identified. 
that could potentially develop as additional multifamily uh, developments. And so there's about 21 acres in this area. Most of it is the Proctor Uson property in this area, but then the Smith brothers have some that's back here on that end. So you have uh, approximately 21 acres here and uh, 5.6 around that area of, on that end. And then you've got this area up here, which is actually a portion of this larger parcel, which fronts onto Ma uh, State Street. But it's the back end that has a zoning for mixed housing. And previously the city had approved a site plan on that property called Copper Lead, <coughs> which had mixed uses on it. So up on the front end by State Street was some uh, offices and retail units. And then back in the back uh, were some apartments. That uh, uh, happened, well, it was approved shortly before the, the economy fell. And then that project just kind of went away. So uh, we have a new owner now, his name is Greg Perry, and uh, he has expressed an interest in maintaining the zoning as it is. <clears throat> he said that to council previously, and he came forward to planning commission and expressed those same feelings again. At the planning commission, Ray Proctor was there and expressed his desire for his property to remain forever and always agriculture. He didn't really express uh, any opposition or support for this proposed zoning change. He doesn't want either, really. Um, and then uh, the Smiths were not there representing their property. We did have uh, a lot of property owners that uh, own or rent in some of these units that are in this area and in the surrounding area. <coughs> All of them that spoke, spoke against the zone change. They felt that um, more commercial adjacent to their properties was not desirable. Now, some of those people may be here tonight. I'm not sure, but that's by and large, the, the sentiment that was expressed at the uh, public hearing. So uh, these are the people that live adjacent to that? Right. Okay. So what was the reason for that one? Well, there was concern for um, just uh, in, impacts of commercial traffic and such going through their neighborhoods, that they like the neighborhood as it has developed. They would like to see more opportunities for more residential development, including and perhaps uh, emphasizing the need for a park for uh, those residences in that area. And just on that subject, the city has a parks master plan that has identified <coughs> in this area, kind of in a bubble area, not specific to any uh, parcel, as a potential area for a future <coughs> park. The city has yet to uh, move forward on acquiring any land or, or making any plans for that. It would be my recommendation before we get too far down the road in developing that property that the city address that more specifically uh, since we do have a lot of uh, residences down there and should more develop there will be an increased need above what exists today for uh, a park in that area the the, the ones identified in blue no there are no uh, proposals of development moving forward is that nothing submitted formally or no discussions in progress? We have, <laughs> we have no discussions of an, em, any eminent uh, uh, proposals for development. Well, we've, uh, in particular, Greg Perry, we've had some discussions with him. There's right. not been anything filed as far as projects are concerned. Right. That's, I guess that's the distinction I'm trying to make, that under the current uh, zoning, have nobody filed at this point for a project that would grandfather their particular. That's correct. Okay. But we have had discussions with individuals uh, that are interested in buying parcels in that area and make, using them in a non commercial way. Yes. Well, there's always there's been discussions ongoing, but okay. nothing that's brought, come forward as to a actual concept or application. Okay. I don't recall what's after that, so let's just try. Okay, that was the last slide, so let's go back. Can you bring that map back up? Oh, there. Okay. Um, so I guess with that, I'll just uh, let you ask any questions, or we can open up to a public hearing. But uh, <coughs> staff does well, not. Let me ask a couple of questions. Okay. Well, let me just finish by saying that staff does not have any strong recommendations one way or the other, as far as the general plan is concerned. Either zone or either subdistrict works, so there would be no general plan amendment required with rezoning it. Um, 
th there are different ways of looking at this uh, as to whether housing uh, is needed or not, or whether more commercial space, more land than what already exists out there is needed or not. So, sure. th so anyway. So from the council to staff before we open it up to the, the public to address this, <coughs> we, we, I believe this council initiated this request. We had initiated the request to stop additional high density housing from going into these areas around the world um, because we have received comment from a large portion of the city about stopping high density housing from going into the area. And I think that that's what triggered the council to go ahead and take a look at okay, what land is left. And can we move forward with a zone change that would prevent any future uh, not already approved projects from continuing? So uh, that's what prompted this uh, this particular <clears throat> thing. Does anybody want to jump in on that? And so with again with the mixed use, I mean commercial is still permitted. Um, it's been moved down to twelve units. <coughs> we, have, we haven't had. Right. We just asked that question. We haven't had anyone submit any currently any plans. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious what the staff or you had discussions with them. So the discussions that I can think of were not for high density housing, it was specifically for an applicant who needed a larger parcel of land for a single application. And it was not for the housing. I've talked with all the property owners. Um, Mr. Proctor, Mr. Uzon, and, and Stan Smith um, to let them know that this is this is coming down the road so that they if they want to participate and, and do that. None of them at the time had mentioned anything on the horizon as far as them selling land or anything like that. Now, uh, Ray has a potential project that is not related to housing or any commercial that this is uh, being pending on, on his property. But um, I think for the most part, they just probably want to keep status quo. Uh, Greg Perry, and he's here tonight, he can kind of tell you where he's at. He first approached us back in 2010 when they bought the property and said, this is a similar project that we would like to do that would include the commercial and the residential. So he's always been consistent in that. Um, obviously, they haven't got to a point of filing for an application, but the message to us has always been, this is the type of project we'd like to do. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that's how I think the mission helps. Any other questions or comments? With mostly out of curiosity, but uh, your earlier slide can indicate it sort of uh, <coughs> the intent versus the reality and show the different sized buildings. Is there are there other solutions besides the zone change that would achieve some of the objectives? Maybe some kind of a mandating of different numbers or different. Different amount of buildings within the zone without actually changing the zone. Could we explore some of the alternatives? We we have over the years since I've been here, and I know prior prior to my coming to work for the study, there's been different uh, methods that have used <laughs> with ordinance requirements as to how to force the development of certain types in this area. There's been the concept early on that we were going to have this mixed use village, that we're going to have true mixed use with commercial on the bottom floor and residential on the top. And we're going to have this village atmosphere. And there's a lot of things that that we've tried there for a while we had on the books a 50-50 a percentage that on a property you'd have to do 50 commercial and 50 residential or some kind of a mix. But but with the different sizes of properties and, and boundaries of properties, that didn't always make sense. And there's um, a, you know different types of developments and proposals that come forward that just don't fit into that that specific number that doesn't always work. And so um, we, we went away from that um, and, and we've, we've tried to encourage commercial development out there all the time, but the only applications we get are the multiple family. Uh, well, with the exception of the Walmart coming in with the carrot of additional density. But when we brought it down to 12 units to the acre and we added a lot of different requirements mm -hmm. in there, it is now very, very difficult to achieve 12 units to the acre, meeting all the other requirements that we have built in. The only project that has been 
proposed and approved under the newer ordinance requirements is the Garden Grove uh, on Proctor Lane there just above uh, Grove Boulevard. So in, in this area uh, was approved to meet the ordinance requirements of the three different types of housing and open space and all that. Well, they're uh, between eight and nine years to the acre. So uh, they, they could have, had they had a different program <coughs> plan, they could have achieved a higher density. This is what they chose to go with, but still, when we've looked at it from a staff level, it's very difficult to get even 12 units to the acre. And there's a lot of people who have looked at the properties and gone, oh, okay, well, goodbye, we'll go somewhere else. That's because of the... They're looking for a higher density. Yeah, they're saying it doesn't pencil with the property values. Wow. Yeah, if anybody inquires over the last couple of years, we've told them it's a lot more difficult to achieve that density and we tell them what the requirements are. <coughs> One a developer did go for it, and we did approve a project. And I would say it's 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 actually a larger percentage <coughs> single family than it is multifamily. And so I think we haven't seen that come out of the ground yet. But I'm thinking that when we do see it, we're going to like the product. And I think that we may not feel dissatisfied to see more of that in that area. I think it will blend in well just uh, with the nature of that area. Uh, what we do not currently permit is more of the three-story um, apartment buildings, period. We don't allow that at all, ever, anywhere down there. Anymore. The, the requirements of the zoning do not permit that. It has to be a smaller scale type of multifamily development. But I, I'm not sure that the, the general population, all of the residents, understand what that current zone is. Oh, sure. And in fact, most of the comments that we received which prompted this was we don't want any more multifamily <coughs> density. And so it's kind of in their minds more of a black and white. And so when they see more projects coming up, they wonder why we haven't listened and responded. So what you're seeing here tonight is the council's attempt to respond in an open way to the public's request. And I recognize we're going to have other this is where we are now. So we kind of drove this based on uh, requests from the public, comments from the public. And I, would, I will also add to that that um, for a beautifully staged, multi staged living in a city, uh, you want about 30, 25% high density and, the, and then staged. and until you have your um, assisted living at the end. And right now we are at 29% what? high density. Well, we have different numbers depending on whether you're looking at a current uh, development that exists or what is available through zoning. But uh, we're in the 30% range depending on which way you're wrong, but there's also. Um, some requirements for a certain amount of affordable housing, which the city of Pleasant Grove has more than after that. And now there are other cities that are trying to catch up with, with their need to provide that level of housing. Mm -hmm. the, the funny thing with uh, affordable or moderate income housing is that it's based on a certain percentage of housing in the community, not just all over Utah, but what what's <coughs> predominant in Pleasant Grove. And it's interesting to see that a lot of the new product of multifamily that has come into Pleasant Grove is not necessarily in the category of affordable housing. If you're in the halls, we just cleared out, I think, eight or ten chairs here on the back row. So if you want to <coughs> come first, sir, fight that out, that would be great. Oh, of course, that was... <laughs> 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 
45 minutes fulfills your requirements. <laughs> Trust me, I'm a mayor badge candidate. <laughs> We'll be here after for any uh, There's also four chairs up here on the front. There's two more left if anybody wants to come up here. Right up front here. Okay. Anything else, Ken? Council, anything else before we open it up? Okay. We would love to have feedback from the public now um, on this item. If you could come up to the podium and state your name and address, and then if you're a resident, let it grow. And if it's related, if you're like a developer or something, so that you can kind of get a, an idea of where you're, what you're coming from. Can I get that laser pointer? No problem. Greg, you can move the tip of your microphone. Just the tip. Just the tip. Oh, yeah, there we go. Hello, Greg Perry, owner of 1650 West on State Street. <coughs> um, owner of this parcel right here, uh, along with uh, some other investors that aren't here tonight. I'm their Utah representative. Thank you, Council, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I can't say that I'm thrilled to be here again. <laughs> Um, on this uh, Tuesday evening, uh, it's my wife's birthday tonight. I was hoping to take her out, maybe to dinner. I said, "Sorry, I have to go." Still got time with me. Yeah, <laughs> out of here in three minutes. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, that that ship has sailed, and uh, so I'm back here again, uh, trying to defend my property rights uh, before the city. I was <coughs> listening to Ken. Uh, Ken's presentation, I was really struck by the overall situation because sometimes you know you hear that phrase, there's this is a solution in search of a problem. This isn't even a solution because the 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 so-called problem is that there's too much high density housing going into Pleasant Grove. There's no high density housing permitted in the grove at all. So if your constituents, you know, have a concern about that. This law, <laughs> they don't send it to me because I can't build high density housing on my property now anyway, even if I wanted. To. So now you're going to ban any housing on the property at all, <coughs> even low density housing, which is all it's really zoned for. Then, uh, and so the rationale for that, I can't really find. But for, for starters, I know it uh, by Ken's admission that. They've tried to encourage um, retail development, and it hasn't come. So that so there's very low, if if you know, very low to non-existent demand for more retail. It's very slow. And so, what's the solution? Well, let's zone more retail. That does not make sense to me at all. Um, there's no retail demand, so we'll force people to zone for more retail. Now, I get that the city wants more sales tax and everything, but the, look, trust me, if this if my whole property is zoned entirely retail, the city actually, it's, it's very problematic to get any retail out of that site because now how am I going to fit retail all the way in the back here? This is, this is all residential right here with the viewpoint apartments right here. So it's surrounded by residential. And now I'm supposed to stick retail all the way back in there making all these residents unhappy because they don't want to they don't want to retail going deep into their neighborhood so it's it's certainly in line with if you look at this zoning line here for me to continue to have low density housing back here it very much blends in with the current environment of that neighborhood for starters and um, so that's, there's a strong argument for that and then as well, it's like I said, it's very difficult for me to fill this entire parcel full of retail. So what I've been trying to do is attract a mid-box size retail tenant to be the core of that retail frontage area near State Street with perhaps some retail pads surrounding it, some restaurants. And then we could do some low-density townhomes and other types of, of uh, 
uh, apartments, you know, but within the low density code, it's, you know, you can try to get to 12 units. Like Ken said, it's really hard. Eight to nine units has only been achieved. So I would do lo low density housing in the back. And I've had a lot of developers come to me and say, hey, we'd like to buy off the, you know, the back portion of your property and do the, that part. And I said, no, it's not the way to go about this. We need to, we need to develop it as a whole, plan it, present it to the city council as a, you know, as an integrated package, showing them, look, we're bringing in retail, we're bringing in low density, and it works. So I don't see a problem. I don't see that this proposed rezoning even fixes the problem that some of your constituents have. If, if they really have a problem with that, you could pass a law saying, okay, no more high density in the Grove Zone. And that would, that would, you know, that would be fine. It wouldn't change anything, by the way. But maybe optically that would look good. <laughs> if optics are that important. Personally, I live in Provo just up the road. I see multifamily high density going up everywhere in Orem and Provo. And, ever, and I see Pleasant Grove kind of walling, it, walling itself off, becoming kind of a retirement community. And if it wants to go that direction, that's fine. But you're not going to attract the younger families, the job creators, the people that shop, the people that start businesses and do and do those things. So that, that's kind of an aside. It's not really even an issue today because we, I can't build multi high density on my property even if I wanted to. So it's not even, not even an issue tonight. I guess in some, you know, I feel strongly about my property rights. <coughs> Certainly devalues my property significantly. I, uh, you know, I've talked to some realtors, you know, 25, 30, 40% uh, right off the top. That's well over a million dollars for me. Now, if somebody was going to take that kind of money out of your pocket, would you feel passionate about it? I would. Sure. W would you perhaps litigate to put a stop to that? I certainly would, and we certainly will. So please, you know, also keep that in mind. We'll look at all of our options. I mean, we really have no choice. I mean, there's, so, uh, you know, that's that's really where, where I come out on this. I, I really find no rational reason for, for the rezoning change. It doesn't solve the, the perceived problem, and it simply uh, harms, uh, you know, your... Uh, citizens and constituents and I think you'll hear from some of the other other property owners that feel the same. Thank you. Thank you. Do, any, do any of you have any questions for me? Or yeah. Seems like you're 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 happy the way it's right now. Well yeah, because I'm trying to develop that parcel, attract a retail tenant for the core. Mm -hmm. I can't I mean I can't find a retail tenant that will fill that whole block. You find me a Costco or something, I mean there's we all know the story right now with retail. I mean everyone's buying things on Amazon. The big boxes are not going up anymore. Home Depot, Costco, they're not going to go on that site anymore. It's just, we live in an Amazon world now. And so there there will be a mid-box or smaller size retail that can fill that state street frontage. But if you classify that as retail in the back, it's just going to sit there. And I'm going to lose money. You're not going to get any sales tax. You know. We see many examples of that in other areas where we have done projects similar to described before mm -hmm. where there have been mixed where the commercial is to be in the front mm -hmm. and the uh the housing to be in the back and typically what we've seen happen is the housing component comes in and says we'll develop first mm -hmm. and then the land between them and the street remains vacant to this day right and and we don't, we don't see the retail come at all right not i mean not at all right and so this is this is I think where the concern comes in, and, and you know, like you said, currently the faster market <coughs> is for a housing component. Um, the the slower market demand that usually follows is the retail component. It's based on rooftops and shoppers, etc. And then it's complicated by the internet uh, presence that we have. <coughs> And I would simply suggest that the council and the planning commission can solve that problem by requiring developers to build everything at once. You know, if they want to build everything at once, it doesn't even it doesn't require a, uh, the heavy hand of a zoning change. Uh, that is a blunt instrument to to get at a problem that can be really adjusted. Try it the other way in the beginning. Yeah. And there's a 
there's no development at all. Yeah. Because most of them can make a pencil by putting up empty shops out front, knowing that they're not going to be able to deal with retail right away. Right. And their primary <laughs> objective was to get the housing in the front. Well, there, I, I would just suggest there are a lot of different ways of going about tackling that problem instead of instead of zoning. We understand. Currently, what our residents are telling us, the vast majority, is that we see a lot of high density, which you can see is already built. And there's no retail. It's empty. By and large, it's empty. If you look for retail, right as I said. So there, that's where we're getting our our uh, input from. The people who vote to elect us to represent them. So if somebody can come in like yourself and prove it differently, that'd be great. But right now we don't see that. Well, I don't understand really the rationale of saying there's there's low retail demand, so we'll zone more retail, and that will somehow make retail come. I don't. I don't really. Actually, not really. We didn't have retail then, so there's no retail. If there was retail, um, you'd be shopping there, but there's no retail because we keep filling with high density housing. And the taxpayers of Holy Grove want a place to keep their tax dollars here in the city. And to fix our roads and to fix our public safety and to do all these things, we need a stronger tax base. And every time we build a home, whether it's single family, uh, residential, whether it's high density, we know we have lost out on that tax base for many, many years to come. So that's the rationale. <coughs> we have tens of thousands of taxpayers here that are, are desperate for retail, but it's low retail because there's no retail because we keep getting it up to high density. So that's the rationale. When I speak of retail demand, I mean from the developer side. I'm, I mean, I'm in discussions from the retailers themselves, saying, "Hey, come to Pleasant Grove. I want to build. A re I want to build a built suit building for you, and and have you lease it for me." And they say, "No, <laughs> there's no retail demand." That's what I. That's my point. Is there is just no retail demand from the retailers themselves, not from the shop front, not not from the shop. Front. <coughs> I think. Creating retail demand on the shopper side is another discussion, and I have ideas about that. But it involves high density housing, and I know you're trying to go the other way. You're trying to go the opposite direction of all the cities around you, and so that's that's fine. But that's uh, you know, that's a different discussion because I can't. There's, this isn't a discussion about high density housing. No high density housing can be built in the growth zone right now. Does that green map look so high density? So, do, do your developers of all of that green is high density. There's some, I mean, Ken, you can point out some of the high density projects. The viewpoint is a high density project. Well, high density. But yeah, exactly. So, um, the citizens think that that is all high density to a residential developer. They think that's all high density. Yeah. Um, so, we have to define high density as to how many units per acre is high density. Right, and right now you can't so, build above 12 units, and you can't, and even if you do build, if I were to build residential in the back, I would have to have three different products. One of them would have to be single family detached, one of them townhomes, and then the other one could be uh, multifamily, and I and they and the single family detached has to be the largest component. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, Ken. And so it's it's really low density. It's something that your constituents, frankly, should so, so not. That's now. Before, we have some developments down there. In fact, Ken, do you know what the population is just in that area? Uh, do you know how many units we have? Uh, the, the viewpoint and this project, the high density residential overlay, was 18 units. And is that our highest density? 18. So we have a, we have a 22 unit. Right, and I. And yeah. that's not high density. Well, no, that is definitely high density. I can't build that on the property I own. I understand because of the current ordinance. Because of the current ordinances, and you're taking away even the ability to do low density. So, yeah, my, you know, I'm just, I'm simply just saying, please let me. If I can't do high density, please let me do low density. You know, we're not trying to argue with you. Yeah, we're agreeing with. You. Yeah, exactly. Yes, that right. is exactly what. The I know, and I'm, in, you know, and it's I'm, in response to our residents asking us to do that. So I don't, because I, from what I hear, the residents are saying no high density, which is but 22, eight, you, you know. Because anything that looks like an apartment or um, condo that has a garage or something like that, that's high density. That's what I'm trying to make the point of defining what high density is to you because you're a developer. That doesn't look like high density. Right. But it does, in fact, look like high density to the people of the citizens of the 
you know, I, I don't know if any of the gentlemen were here that were at the planning commission um, and they live in this, some of the newly constructed, what I call low density is townhomes, uh, which I would call low density <coughs> two, three, four units per, and, and they wanted to keep things as they were. In fact, the planning commission voted against this proposal, which I, I don't think was noted, but I just like to note that planning commission voted against it, <coughs> no reason for it in, in their eyes. And, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I understand. I think what most people feel of high density is apartments like the viewpoint, which are like 18, 20 units per acre. Um, the eight or nine units per acre that it, you know, was recently approved by the city council, it's pretty low. That's, and that's the only thing I can build. So, so, so just, to be, just to be clear, okay. what, what we are hearing from the majority of the residents is we want that's that's what they're saying. Whether whether there's a demand there for it or not, from a from an actual developer perspective, the residents are saying we want retail. That's what they're asking for. Now we're not saying people are beating the door down to build retail. Now, we can show you lots of retail area that has remained blank for 10, 12, 15 years, <coughs> even though the the residential area behind it has already been developed, exception being Walmart. So in response, <coughs> this is what you're seeing. We're not, we're not saying that from a developer perspective, this makes sense. That is not what the council is saying. We're saying in response to the people that we are accountable to represent, they don't want any more housing in this area. Okay. Well, I mean, I mean, I, I do understand what you're saying. Okay. I think I've, I've heard we're different trying, things. We're not trying to argue. With no, you. I know. I, I know. I, I've heard different things tonight. You know, I've, okay. it started out being no, we don't want any uh, more uh, high density apartments. Now it's, we only, we only want retail, which is what you're saying. Right. So, there you, go. Uh, um, you know, and, and certainly uh, there's plenty of retail acreage out there. And, and this, uh, this, this slight uh, zoning change, which affects me significantly, um, Deeply, personally, gravely, doesn't really change that picture. You know? And I would love to see the city, um, you know, at least come up with some studies and show, you know, uh, at least study this issue further and discuss what type of retail would go so deep into this residential corridor here and at least make yeah, an I argument. I don't think that's where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. and, and I hope you see that. We're not approaching this in some scientific, knowledgeable way, saying, oh, no problem. We know that it's very easy for to attract a, a third possible to this part of the town. There we there we agree that you're not okay. approaching this in a scientific, knowledgeable saying, way. We agree what completely. We're saying, <laughs> is, what we're saying is the people that have elected us to represent them do not want any more housing. And they're going to call the whole thing high density period. So that's that's the dilemma that we're facing right. here. We're trying to respond to their requests. Right, right. Okay. And that may not come across favorable to people that own parcels and want to develop housing. Right. So we're here to hear opinions, but I just want to make it as painless as possible from an understanding perspective. Right. Right. And and there we would just disagree, but you know I do understand where you're coming from, Mayor, and appreciate you. Appreciate you. <coughs> Welcome to come over and take a okay. stand here. Just a minute. Didn't mean to kick it off. Right? No, no, okay. Um, I just wanted to respond. Is there an opportunity? Go ahead and, go ahead and oh. state your name. Oh, yes, Mike Whistling, 1636 East 400 South. Um, is there an opportunity in situations like this to have a blended development, as Greg suggested, to come to a Sort of meeting of minds, and it is it exists that way now. Okay, it, it is it is currently set up to have this. Uh, I think the way that Diana described it is more of a stage development. It's the same way you have like uh, in the downtown zone, where you have the zero property line development, and then it kind of goes into a less less uh, of that. And finally, okay, I'm only proffering that as a as a suggestion for okay. considering um that's not the reason i'm standing here greg were you done where do you guys right here
Well, there you go. Right. That's <laughs> fine. Go, go ahead. Any, I, I didn't mean to take up so much time. Just, uh, no, I think we appreciate that the dialogue. Um, I'd like to thank Director Young for his preparation for tonight. That's really awesome. And the council members for indeed um, voting for with the constituency. So thank you for that. Um, I can only find that this is the appropriate time for me to bring up my comments and it's in zoning considerations. Um, two things that I've noticed that might be problems in future development in Cedar Hills. One of us in Crow. Sorry, I don't still have a house in Cedar There was another meeting just up Yes, <laughs> right, 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 which I was at. That's right. I'm sure <laughs> so, um, um, but the two things are, is, is the parking in the, um, what is, <coughs> is, is low density be, or high density homing being excluded entirely in Pleasant Grove or future, future development? Future in this area. That okay, just this area. Okay, I see a, a wonderful urban experiment going on in the pipe, the pipe storage area, apartments going up. You know, as an engineer, I look at that structure and I'm thinking. I'm sorry, are you talking about the pipeline that the city owns? Yes. There is no, no what is that development going up? Senior it's, housing. Senior this housing. Is senior housing. Yeah. Okay. It's actually staged senior housing. So okay. So maybe parking good. isn't a problem at that location. I just do the math and I'm thinking, gosh, that's a lot of it. Okay. Um, my biggest concern is um, the uh, proximity laws or ordinances from... Uh, large buildings to major thoroughfares. Um, this concern was brought up in a small meeting of other citizens that I meet with. Um, and I'll, I'll bring up a case in point. <coughs> Along Pleasant, Pleasant Grove Boulevard, there is a new buildings, relatively new, that have gone in that uh, are very, very close to the highway, and very close to the sidewalks. Um, I was wondering if we can take a look at codes that do not, once we put a building there, I see the future of Pleasant Grove Boulevard being a two lane highway, I mean, not highway, but I mean, not just the single lanes with the, you know, the middle lane, but two lanes. We don't have any room for expansion on these roads 20 years from now. If we plop down a building 13 feet from the highway or from the road. So can you tie that into the item that we're discussing yes it would be it would be zoning you know i don't know where else to bring this up right. just looking at the meeting I mean <coughs> not necessarily the specific okay, so, but i so think this we is, this, isn't, if, this isn't open for that so okay I'm all right sorry. If, um, we, can just, we can have you discuss that with can okay and then we can come up on a different different meeting item. in a future date right or on the open session part of the meeting but Fair enough. Tonight we're really discussing a specific ordinance. Okay. I think we should consider parking in that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Anyone else? I'm quite terrified to do this. Um, my name is Heather Downs, 1117 East, 740 South. Um, and I am one of those citizens that is against more high density housing. Um, however, having been a business owner and I had a business up um, in Linden by Wallabies where that strip mall goes very deep and, and our store was in the back of that. Um, and I see that as a potential problem. <coughs> um, that Linden strip mall, people go in and out, us included. Um, because there's just not the visibility from State Street, even with the signage. Um, and so from my perspective, as a citizen, I, I like the idea of if Greg can find um, retailers and do everything all at once, I very much like that idea. Um, and, and rezoning the bottom section where commercial sites would be more visible from the roads or things. Uh, but I just, I just don't see, having been a retailer, um, from that perspective, I, I would not put my store back. <coughs> it's, it's too far back. So, um, yes, I absolutely agree. 
I don't want more high density homes. Um, I single family units would be great there, but um, but I don't think that's a great spot for retail. Thank you. <coughs> I'm uh, Ray Proctor, and I'm the one that owns the Proctor property down here. <coughs> and in 1852, that property came into my family's name, into my family. My ancestors were cattle people that came in here from Canada. And that's the reason the lane was named Proctor Lane from 89 Clear the Linden Bolt Harbor. I own range ground out on the acre, out on the Oakley Mountains. But I have been about hounded to death by developers wanting to develop that up. A guy come to, to <coughs> came to my wife and said, like to buy your farm she said it's not for sale he told her his name she left and then she told me who he was and knock came on the door and i opened the door and he said i'm so and so i said it's not for sale <laughs> it was the guy that had talked to her and i shut the door he stood out in the outside and he shook his head and he came back up and knocked the door on the door again and he said well you don't know what i'm willing to offer you for it i said don't make any difference not for sale shut the door on him but i can sit in my living room look out at that corner on the northeast of my property on a weekend at the end of the month and you cannot believe how many truckloads of furniture is going out and how much truckloads of furniture is coming in and we got a real dangerous situation because we have our driveway <coughs> coming down proctor lane if we turn our directional lights we're going to turn into our yard i sat the other morning and counted 28 cars that never stopped for the stop sign they just come out and go around the corner if you got your directional lights on that you're gonna like you're gonna turn down that road they'll pull right out and about wipe you out and uh, out at the back there where that road comes down from walmart i had a i got a real drive there i had a car come down that road he run the stop sign, he knocked out my fence, he broke my gate pipe all up, he went out my field and turned around and tried to jump up over the curb and gutter, and he couldn't do it, so he backed up and took another run at it, knocked a hole in his oil pan, then he got out and took off. The police showed up and seen what he had. And they called a wrecker and impound the car and hauled the car off. My fence, two days before that, I had a dry, big draft, black draft horse out in the field. And I couldn't see why when they hauled the car away, they couldn't come and tell me I had a hole in the fence because if he had got out, I'd have been doing this to my farm that horse is big enough that and I went out I fixed the fence now and I would like to have so that don't happen again I'd like to have some cement barricades put across there straight across from where that road comes down so they can hit the barricades and see if they can put <coughs> the into my field but I have no desire to have my farm zone high density and the reason i don't i'm still running cattle and you don't know how great it was to live out there when there was nobody out there because i can go out in the spring of the year along that north fence and i can gather up three and four garbage cans full of garbage 
<laughs> plus you don't know how many garbage cans full of whiskey bottles I can gather up also. And I, I just feel like that as far as I'm concerned, if she's going to rezone it, you could put it back in agriculture. <laughs> <coughs> but you don't know how great it was to live out there when there was nobody out there. I could hunt, hunt pheasants when I wanted to. I'd go fishing when I wanted to. It was a great place to live when I was a kid. And I remember the time when the old road out in front, people was going to the lake resort on wagons and then buggies, OSA cars, Model A's going down to the lake resort <coughs> because they had a dance hall down there and they had a pavilions down there and they had a swimming pool. But over right across from the garbage dump, I can still show you the foundation of a fish cannery where they used to sing the German Browns out of Utah Lake and can them and sell them as Utah salmon. And <coughs> If it comes to tell me, telling you where a stream of water is coming from down there, I can tell you that too. And I'd like to, I'm glad to see that we have Len Walker now going to be on the city council because I've worked with Len <coughs> and he's been a very good, very reasonable guy to talk, talk with. And I appreciated the mayor here because he took the time to sit down and listen to my gripes and I'd like to get them. some things took care of down there that's happened to us. We put in for curb and gutter and sidewalk 12 years ago and it's been bid twice and they tell us well we can't do it until they give us more money. 12 years ago it had more than done what it should have done and I thank you for the time I took. Thank you. Ray, I have a question for you. Ray, sorry, while you're up there, you say no no high density housing is what you you don't want that on your property. I don't want that on my property. And you realize that if you rezone tonight, that means no high density housing on your property. I I realize that. I have no hey, it's been in agriculture since eighteen fifty two. When I was a boy. I used to run cattle on the face of Tim, Merton Fork Canyon, from the top of the loop down to Cascade Springs, up midway, up around the Yankee and the Pacific Mine. And if I worked with my dad and put the hay up, it helped move the cattle. And that was also, we was running about 100 head on the Ochre Mountains. I got the pick of five steers out of 90 head of steers. I would put them in, teach them to lead, teach them to show. I'd take one to Spanish Fork, one to Salina, one to Delta, one to North Salt Lake, and one to Ogden. I averaged choice 10 or grand champion on my animals. Because I wasn't like the kids that was in that ag with me because they had to take what they could afford. I got to pick a 90 at the best. I went down to Spanish Fork and I got a trot out to catch a scramble calf. As the first one to get it, got a hauler on it and let it out. My dad, I brought it home and dad said to me, said, what are you going to do with that? I said, why? He said, all it'll be is a deer. You'll never tame it down to show it. So I put it in his feed lot and picked one of the best colored ones and fattened it up and took it back to the stock show and put it in as you and I sugar company sponsored it for me. I got grand champion on it. You don't think the banners didn't come up and I made them very happy, but I didn't dare tell them it was a little cat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Ray.
Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, aloha. aloha. My name is Craig <coughs> 210 South, Proctor Lane, also known as 1300 West. Uh, you've just heard from a citizen of True Americana, Ray Proctor. People watch Duck Dynasty, but Ray Proctor is the real deal. A hardworking farmer and rancher. That's a dynasty unrecognized by Pleasant Grove City. They have tried uh, recognizing with Proctor Lane, but sometimes those signs disappear. Uh, I want to thank you for inviting me by invitation regarding my land and property. It's important to me because in two previous important city council meetings that impacted my property, I was not invited. However, I was invited to and attended the planning commission meetings whenever my property was involved. I researched and expressed my concerns as needed. We, my family, and the Proctor family ask that you do not vote to recommend changing the zone designation to commercial tonight, at least regarding the area on the map stated as Proctor U Zone 21.45 acres. But after listening to the discussion in the planning commission meeting on Thursday, October 22, we also feel it would be wise not to vote to rezone the area for Great Perry. A lot of good ideas came out of there that I don't think was relayed. I don't know, maybe it was relayed to you. <coughs> I post to you three scenarios. A man and his family driving down our, our long driveway, goes past the house, into the backfield, turns around in the hay, in a double cab, long bed truck, pulling a, lo a large trailer house or, you know, a camper turns around in the hay, comes back up our driveway, and then goes back on to Proctor Lane. Scenario number two, two guys in an unmarked white truck come down our long driveway, pull up right next to our kitchen window, look inside, look around, then continue to drive past our garage, and then turn around and go back up the long driveway and head onto Proctor Lane again. Scenario number three, <coughs> A young man carrying his daughter and another toddler circling around him came down our long driveway and he asked me, how old is this house? I answered, it was built in 1852. Wow, he exclaimed, I like old homes like this. Are you the owner? Yes. He quickly asked, do you know if this land has ever been prospected with a metal detector? Hmm, you know, I don't know. Why are you asking these questions? Well, I like to go around homes like these, real old ones, use my metal detector to find treasures. Could I do that <laughs> here? <clears throat> so I pose to you, what would each of you do? And if I could get an answer from each, because I'd like to know, you are voting on my land. I'd like to know who's voting on my land. So, Mr. Eric Jensen, first you, and then we'll go down this way. Just make, make it simple. What's the question? What, how would you react to these three scenarios? Individually or collectively? I like the Okay. Diana Anderson. I don't know. How would you react as a homeowner? This happened to you. Other citizens coming onto your land, <coughs> I, I would be very concerned. Thank you. I have six daughters. <laughs> Mayor. The first two, I would be irritated for they destroyed my hay and didn't offer to replace them and just took off. The third one, I would be suspicious as to <coughs> what the intent was. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> I believe in people's private property rights and they need to be respected. <coughs> Our city could do a better job of respecting property, property rights and we need to do that with, with this particular motion, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, I would be very, very interested in asserting my private property rights on my land. Thank you, Mrs. Stanley. <coughs> so unique situations that obviously I've never been in and you're in a, a home where this 
these different situations are happening and also I agree with the, the mayor and Diana that kind of different different situations and definitely you have rights as, as a private property owner but the council member I need to look at everything as a whole and um, <coughs> definitely take notice of, of these situations that can happen to you and we'll consider that one later on. Thank you Mrs. Lamont. Mrs. Boyd? I, I would be very frustrated actually where I live those kind of incidences happen on occasion so it is very frustrating I sometimes think that um, um, because your home is unique in the area that it may draw attention to people and that could be very frustrating because they're not used to it I find that a lot of people that live next to farms are very fascinated by farms and that and they want their children to witness that <coughs> and experience it but at the same time they have a lack of respect for, for those yeah. farms and those people now, this is just little incidences or some instances. There's many more. Okay. Was, was the trailer just for Mike and Darcy's long drive? I have no idea. <laughs> okay, I'm pretty sure. That's what I would assume. Okay. So, uh, as a refresher, uh, and and I'm repeating the this is from from your own words, uh, uh, Cindy Boyd uh, from the from the little thing on the in the uh, website from the city. To respect and learn from the past, carefully plan for the present, and to protect our quality of life for the future. Uh, ben Stanley focuses city activities on the will of the people and lightening the burdens of residents. Uh, Sid Lamone, to be an example of civic and community service to all residents of Pleasant Grove. And Eric Jensen, enjoy getting out and exploring PG's incredible history and holds countless opportunities for all of its residents. So the above examples are true examples. Probably, uh, they were probably nice people <coughs> coming onto my property. We're all nice people after all, aren't we? Uh, yeah. Anyway, for those particular moments, these are people I do not know that may have meant well for their own particular purposes, designs, and peace of mind. However, on someone else's private property. In our neighborhood, within a quarter mile, various governments have allowed Pleasant Grove Boulevard, which was designed with meandering yet dangerous curves and traffic noise, created a busy street on our property bordered 20 feet from my house or less. A three-story building that's actually about four stories because the property ground level was raised and they have an extra thing going on there with their hot tub room. Uh, this has also caused an ex uh, exist existing drainage of water from my land to stop because of the higher built ground. Uh, a state liquor store, and an alcohol and drug rehabilitation center was built surprisingly within, within walking distance of the liquor store. Uh, the following are Pleasant Grove City decisions from previous administrations and city councils that affected issues regarding the proctor use on property, many yet to be resolved. Uh, one was resolved just recently with uh, uh, thanks to Scott. Uh, this was resolved after a year. Garbage collection noise and rumbling nuisance between 4 a.m. and 5 a.m. in the morning. This, this went on and on and on. And <coughs> we were told that they could do it because it was commercial property. Yet we were living in residential. So I had posed a question to Scott. If this turns into commercial, will I have no recourse? Will they then be able to say, we can pick up any time? Now, Scott has reassured me that Republic won't. But this is not to say that nothing else will. You know, if, if that changes, if I would have to go through this again. Uh, the Walmart Road had invited a car right through the fence onto Proctor property, as Ray had mentioned. Uh, dirt on his farmland, making a lot of valuable growing land unusable to farm. And every piece of, of farmland, I don't know if you've ever been to farm, but a lot of farmers pull trees because it takes up ground that you could be growing something on. So that is unusable farmland right now, along with the, where the city had allowed a road to go through. <coughs> uh, city water master said to take 
one of the oldest water rights in the state, a point of diversion which resulted with a 15 acre foot water right reduced to four acre foot without thorough due diligence performed with the state's Department of Natural Resources, nor notifying the water right owner. And in actuality, his valuable water right was illegally taken by Pleasant Grove City. When he wanted to use a new replaced diversion, he started to flood the neighbor across the street. So he no longer could use that water. Uh, $17,000 being held for 12 years for a curb and gutter that's still not in. <coughs> so these are things that are not resolved yet with Proctor property. Uh, question, how does the rezoning proposal influence current and future potential property value? Somebody might write that down and answer that after I finish. How does, the, how does it influence property taxes? Uh, it was said in Planning Commission, uh, it will not, but is this for sure? Under mixed housing, does the zoning allow for commercial retail development? I understand the answer is yes. So for those citizens who are concerned, commercial is allowed. It is my understanding that members of the city council are concerned that previous councils have allowed multi-unit housing throughout Pleasant Grove City to the point of perceived excess. I stress perceived. Is that the correct assessment of the city council tonight? It's actually about 38%, which is pretty high for our city, not the county. Okay. Okay. And what we're looking at is just a small portion of the entire city. But this is the majority of where the high density, that where the high density is. Okay. Because we have not been quick to sell the land in question to multi-unit housing developers, as has been done by our neighbors, each member of the city council is considering to deny us the same freedom of choices that our neighbors enjoy. Prior to Grandma Proctor's passing, in whose house we live in, it was her desire that the farm stay as a farm. And she expressed that this was also the desire of her husband, <coughs> also named Robert Proctor. My wife and I and our family for the last 20 plus years have honored those wishes and intend to continue to do so. We, the Proctor family, implore you, Mr. Mayor, and each member of the city council and Pleasant Grove city staff, to please continue to work with us and we will work with you. Please resolve all previous concerns with the property family and landowners before you compound matters with a possible predatory rezoning vote against the Proctor family and the heritage land they have owned for over 160 years, earning the state of Utah's recognition as a century farm. We ask you that you do not vote to change the zone designation to commercial tonight. We also support the idea of a buffer zone of stores on the first floor <coughs> and homes above for Greg Perry's proposed projects as an option as well. There's, like I said, there's other things that could, could go there that doesn't have to require changing it to commercial only. Uh, PUD. Planned unit developments and mixed development were talked about in previous city councils. That may never come to fruition if this area is resolved. Also in those early meetings, we have heard from developers that they need more resident rooftops. Greg Perry said that making it a commercial zone only would not develop, uh, only would not develop retail faster, <coughs> if I understood that correctly. And then, Mr. Mayor, you challenged him to prove it otherwise. I don't think so. I said I agreed with him. <coughs> okay. If you were, it doesn't guarantee you're going to get uh, retail in faster. Okay. You may you may hear or you have you have heard from many residents of what they don't and what they do want regarding development of commercial. Yet, are they experts on how to bring in retail? There are many people who bring up problems, 
but they do not bring up solutions. More research is needed regarding this land. I think it would be a premature vote tonight to rezone it. Pleasant Grove staff has not given strong recommendations for or against the request, and the Planning Commission came to reason and has recommended against the rezone change. We ask that you also rethink and research your rezone request and to not vote for their rezone request tonight. Talk to us and we will talk to you. We will work with you. Your vote should not be a vote as a strong arm vote to appease your individual concerns versus the rights of a property owner. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, anyone else wish to speak? My name is Pete Blake. I live at 29 South, 2000 West. Let's see, there's this, this other button, which is right there. And I own this property up in here. Um, I guess, first of all, I would express a um, kind of an annoyance, I guess, that the citizens in one part of town would, would come and, and bring an action through the, the mayor and the city council to uh, affect the zoning in another part of town. Uh, that's something that annoys me a lot that they, uh, you know that they do this kind of a thing. Um, the second one is that remember that you as as representatives of the people represent the folks who live in this area as well. We have thousands of people who live down here. Um, each of these folks who live in one of these housing units uh, lives there because that's that's the place they want to live. They want it. They don't want. It. They don't want a single-family home that has a big yard with grass to, to mow. They want to live in a in a place like this. Um, and these uh, units, as soon as they're built, they're filled. We don't have any any trouble with filling those. Um, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I'll try to speak louder. Um, Lost my train of thought now. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I guess the third thing that I would say is um, I I agree with those folks who have expressed concerns that uh, that individual property rights are are being uh, overruled by uh, by the city council and changing the zoning. I guess I, I really don't have any feeling one way or another about these two parcels. I would like to see the city do something. That would bring commercial development in here. Um, I've lived on this property about 45 years, um, and I remember um, back when the when the the city annexed the property, which has been what 17 or 18 years now. Uh, we had a member of the city council that came by and spoke to all the property owners and encouraged us to sign on to the annexation, uh, and and made what sounded to me anyway, like a promise that, well, uh, commercial development was gonna happen almost overnight and and uh, we would sell this property and, and uh, make all sorts of money on it. Well, that was a long time ago, nothing's happened. So somewhere we need to find out what we have to do to bring commercial development in Pleasure Grove. All of the property down below, below uh, Ray's property here, all of this is owned by, um, uh, by one person whose name I can't remember now, the fellow that uh, helped me out, Mayor. Yeah, Ken, right. Ken, yeah. Um, and this is where uh, possibly where the void will go in. He owns a lot of property down there and he's bought it all. Um, but I, I, I think that um, if there were commercial development that could be put on on any of that property down in that area, why well, it would be a wonderful thing. But I don't know what I don't know what magic key we have to turn to make that happen. <coughs> I'd like to see it happen, but uh, um, I've been waiting a long time for it. Um, anyway, that's about all I have to say. I guess any anybody have any questions for me? Oh, the, I guess the one, other, the one other thing is that we because we do have uh, this high density housing. We have a lot of new people in here, and we need to find a place to put a church. 
and we have we have talked with uh, with Ray about uh, the possibility of putting a church down in this area here. Um, and I've been assured that uh, if if the, the city council decides to vote uh, to make that into commercial sales, that it will not affect our our desire or our hope to put a church down that area is, is that correct is from we understand when you say the people are looking for a church are you speaking for the church i'm not speaking for the church i'm just um saying that uh our our stake is in negotiations with uh with mr proctor and with the church okay. building department to procure land in that area and I, if I understand correctly, this uh, <coughs> zoning, either denying the zoning change or approving it will not affect our ability to put a church building in that area. So we, we can't really speak for the proctors or the church right. on but all, what all, they're doing. That's a private transaction. Right, I understand that. But all I'm asking is, will, will, will the zoning change if we approve it or deny it either way? Uh, will we still be able to church can go pretty much anywhere. pretty much anywhere? Okay. Okay. That's my only concern. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Anyone else? Kira Harris, 60 Alpine Drive. Um, I'm with Greg. <laughs> I don't really see a good reason to change that. And I think where we already have a property owner that is actively pursuing something that uses it the way it's being used, we should respect that. Um, as far as the lower section goes, I don't really see any reason one way or the other. I think that the you know property owners down there have a lot of concerns, but it sounds like those concerns stay the same regardless of how it's zoned. So I guess I would kind of say, yes, go for it in the lower section, but I would be opposed to rezoning the upper property. Okay, anyone else want to address the council on this item? Anyone? <coughs> That's a landscaping opportunity. <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back up here for discussion. Um, council? I'm happy to start. Um, from my perspective, we've got private property rights. I think Greg is exactly right that we've got a proposed solution that doesn't actually solve anything and addresses a point. There's not high density housing permitted there. The density that exists there is reasonable to create the buffers and the Mesh properly with the adjacent areas. I have always heard from the public that they don't want high density housing. We don't allow it. That's not the problem here. And I've heard that they want us to respect private property rights. I think we need to do that. <coughs> so when we're done with discussions, unless I'm completely persuaded opposite, my, I see that hard to imagine. I'll be making the motion that we deny this zone change and that we stick with what we have that works. It makes more sense and has more likelihood of being a solution. I'll go next. Um, I, I love <coughs> when this council feels a problem and we hear this and learn. I think our intent in the beginning was very, was very right. I think our concern is, is that we want to see less um, high density housing. Um, more often than not, though, I have agreed with Greg over the years. And uh, I always like when he comes and brings, he's very eloquent in his expressions, and I'm very grateful for that. I want to talk to him with a long time. Um, he is right. And uh, so, along with him, I would I will vote to not change the things. I'll venture out. Um, it's interesting as we first started discussing this tonight, I thought this is the million dollar question that we've been trying to answer for as long as I've been around and listening to developers come in and say um, we need more rooftops, we need more doorknobs in order to get the commercial employed into, into the 
area, and that's been a discussion for quite some time, which comes first, you know, the retail or um, in kind with the commercial. <coughs> I, um, and then we always get the residential uh, contractors that say it won't cancel out. And so if I had a dollar for every time I heard uh, it's not going to cancel out, then I, I uh, have a little stash. But under the circumstances for tonight and what we're discussing here, uh, I want to ask Ken or Tina Scott um, a question. So we have Proctor's property that is still a farm. And can it be a, can it remain agricultural? Can we put it back to agricultural? Till they at that point determine which direction they want to go with that property. So we're not, we've had it commercial, we've had it residential in that area. Can we put it back to a neutral state? I guess is what I'm saying. So that the proctors <coughs> are protected, and then at some stage when they make that decision where they want to go, then we would hear that as a city and then uh, work together to have that come about. That's just a they're already protected. They're already a, a legal non conforming use. And so no matter what you zone around it, if they want to maintain their farm and don't sell it, they can maintain their farm right. and not sell it. So if, if, the, if they want to come in and ask to have a rezone and put it and rezone it and add zones, they're perfectly entitled to do that. I'm not sure what community development's recommendation would be on an application like that. But they can ask, and they are protected right now. They, they're not forced to do anything on their property other than what they're doing. Right, I understand that. But I think just as a feeling of it's not residential, it's not commercial, it's neutral. I don't know how to say that. Well, the that other way. option you could do that I'm thinking of the top of the top is you can go and ask for an agricultural protection. <laughs> That would make him feel better about the potential complaints from neighbors about his ongoing farming activities. That might be an also an option that he might want to I just wonder if there's not something that we can create for them that they are feeling somewhat protected and it's not we're not saying you have to get some commercial or some residential. I know that at some point when they sell and that would become uh, a discussion with us as the city. But anyway, just something to throw out there. Yeah, I, I mean, if, I think if they want to pursue that, then they can apply for that. And then the planning commission and council can address that. I'm assuming the general plan does not have that as right. The general plan would also have to be amended. Okay. All right. I just, just a question. I'm just just filling and protecting the farmer. Yeah. Would they pay the property tax as a property? I think I'm guessing they already have the agricultural they exemption right the now. Green they're paying the green belt rate. Right. Anyway, just a comment there. I think it's by one of the discussions we've had over the years, and when we talked about, well, is it 50 50 <coughs> you know, 50 retail, 50 uh, re, um, residential? You know, at one stage it was 600 feet, I believe, on State Street, and that's how this was created, I believe. As I remember back that this on the on the Perry property, the reason that is commercial out front because at one stage we had I think a six hundred foot buffer and then behind that was residential, meaning the fact that you know you're not gonna be able to get commercial in that lower complicated property. So and, uh, no, like, on the on the Greg Perry, that the reason that was is like that is because that was under the at one stage, the 600 foot buffer on State Street, so it was commercial, and then behind it, we allowed the residential. So that's why there's that distinct difference. Uh, I think the history might be a little bit important here because right. what Cindy's alluding to is before this was mixed housing, I think most of this was mixed use zone, and part of that zone was a requirement that at least 50% had to be supposed to be 50 50 residential. Right and uh, commercial and i think the mayor alluded to the fact that you'd have people come in and they do the 50 percent uh, residential and then 
that, and then the commercial never happened. And so that was a frustration to us as a city, and that's why we created this zone. And we had the specific discussion, and I can't remember, four or five years ago, to say that 12 units an acre was acceptable. That was the decision that was made back then. Now, obviously, there's constituents talking to you that are, are, are maybe telling you differently than what we decided four or five years ago, but that was the decision at the time was, um, we don't want apartments anymore, but 12 units an acre or something. We're okay with. And I think as far as changing anything tonight, I don't feel good about doing that. Stage. I don't feel um, I, could, I feel like there was a reason on the State Street property, and um, I think we just need to have a, a little bit more discussion. I'd like to see some ways of protecting helicopters <coughs> in that area. I also am very aware that we need open space in the area, and I think the city, as long as I've been here discussing parks and whether there needs to be another church in the area, that would be great. But I think. You know, we just need to be planning that area as far as open space for all of the homes and people that are living there. But change it to commercial is actually for the open space. No, but I don't think we need to change it at this point. I'd like to see us work out something with the uh, with the farmer and also to have further discussion as far as the open space. Okay. But I'm sorry to have the tomorrow. <coughs> so at the very beginning, I wrote down property rights. I wrote it down on everybody's obviously properties. Um, that's why I asked at the very beginning if this really affects anything now, right? because the 12 units per acre, right? It is what it is. We haven't seen anything in the pipeline right now for these properties. <coughs> and so and then reading through the planning commission notes and the people's uh, comments, private property. And so I, as is right now, and that's why I was getting at it at the beginning, is, is that maybe we just need to know. And I'm sorry if you know, at 8 to 8 o'clock we hear that. Um, but I, I do, we, I think we really have to listen to the people that live down there and the people that own the land and consider their rights. And Craig back there, the reason I answered the way <coughs> is I had, a, I had an individual when I first bought my house come to my house and asked me if he could wave his wand, and he found a lucky horseshoe on my car. I, I live at one point north end. And so I've had that hanging up in the back here ever since. So I think the horseshoe is like a key yeah, like <laughs> That was part of the stipulation of me being nice and letting him come on and my property any gold or whatever he found, you got to keep private property rights. Uh, so that's why I answered what I did for you, is because I had that hanging up, and it's, it's brought a whole different thing. But, uh, Anyway, I think we have to respect what's going on down there. Yeah, like I said, nothing's going on. And we still bring commercial to that, to that area as it is. So, just to be brief. Would you like to call it? Okay. I would actually leave the zone where Greg is, as is, <coughs> and, and change the, the pocket area for him because the pocket area, I know they do stuff as well, but. I'll say to the public tonight, that makes more sense to me to rezone um, to commercial only. When I was out campaigning just recently for, for council, it wasn't roads and it wasn't public safety, it was actually high density variables as well. People want a tax base so we can help solve those problems and they keep wondering why we continue to take away from that tax base, allowing more homes, whether it's single family, whether it's high density. They want some place to shop that their families from places where they're tired of going outside of our community. <coughs> these services and every time they allow a, a housing unit to go into these now they can it. <coughs> so and next week we will have another property right agenda item coming up not with accessory apartments um we need to respect the right of the homeowner but neighbors have rights too and neighborhoods have rights and it's a balance that the council has between private property owners and the rest of the community and so hearing from our constituents and Others in the community, um, and after hearing the planning commission discussion and whatnot, like I said, I would I would leave the great periods as is and consider rezoning this to commercial only. That's the future of Pleasant Grove, and I think we need to find a balance between um, doing what's right for the city and the private property owners. I don't we're not obviously in a positive way. We're just rezoning to um, hopefully so they can still find uh, 
visible for for their rights, but also for their community and the city of all that area. And that's to me how we're going to fix a lot of the problems in our city that area together. So, yeah. question, question for Shaq, maybe. If it was um, moved to continue, it just keeps it as is. And we just have I, I would prefer we don't. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Unless there's something we really, I, mean, I think we either need to kind of give the yes or no and, and to continue it, unless there's just some more information you guys want to make the decision. Then, other than that, I don't think we need to make a decision. I, I'd hate to string out. We're done with discussion. I'm happy to make a motion. I don't want to cut any discussion short. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't vote, so yeah. I, I think that there's a balance that, that we need to strike here. First of all, there's a recognition that, that a city council doesn't actually sell land, develop businesses, build houses. That's not our charter. That's not what we do. <clears throat> the most we can do that affects that is put into place zoning ordinances and areas based upon the professional recommendation from staff, which kind of lays the guideline for those that do develop and build homes or businesses rather than and say, ah, here is an area that I'm allowed to do the kind of business I would like to do. Once you establish that framework, you leave it alone, and that gives people like Greg or others an opportunity to look at it and say, I think I can do my business here. If we keep changing the zones or the designs or the rules of the game within that, then we send a confusing message to the development world about what is actually allowed. And it makes it difficult if it's a larger project with a multi-year effort involved where you have to sign people up ahead of time and, and pre-lease things. That's one concern. On the other hand, um, you have individual owners of property that may fall within a natural area of development and they ultimately hold the cards. If they choose to sell the land <coughs> to a developer, then it's going to be incumbent upon both the owner of the land that wants to sell it and the developer to come to the city and make an application for a change on that land so that it will accommodate what the developer wants to achieve. That's how, that's how that happens. Um, there's this weird third thing that plays into this, and that's the, the rest of the 35,000 people that neither own the land more develop. And we've had a lot of that in our city where people who are not business people, they don't have a background in retail or in development of office space. They have a, a vision of what they'd like to see, but they don't have the resources, the skills, or the talents to step in and make it happen. And yet they want to call the shots when it comes to other people's money and other people's land about what they should be doing. And this is the most dangerous part of the role that we play. Trying to help the masses that put you in place, in place to accomplish what they want to do, but they themselves are not willing to put the money into opening the restaurant, opening the dress store, opening the business that employs people. It's the risk. Risk is on the person that owns the land, and it's on the person that's going to develop it. It's not on the third party that doesn't have a clue how to run a business. So my opinion on these things are that the city council should work with landowners that are in the area that make the most <coughs> sense for what can happen in that zone and work with them on an overall plan and put it in place and Leave it alone and let the development community and the landowners come together and work their deals and then come back and bring it in as long as it conforms we can approve them and they can be honored. <coughs> i would like to see us slow down on 
constantly changing the underlying fabric of the game. Because I think this is where Pleasant Grove runs afoul of falling behind with every other city that's around us uh, up and down the Wasatch Front. Now, with respect to the specific uh, requests of uh, Bray and Craig and Ray, <coughs> I think that far too little has been done to address their specific concerns with respect to this particular proposal that's in front of us. I did not hear uh, Craig say that he never wants to make this high density housing or never wants to make this a commercial development, but he certainly doesn't want somebody else making that decision for him. And not until at least the city has come together with him and resolved some of the other issues that have been outstanding for decades. So my, my advice on this particular piece of legislation is bury it and let's go work on the things that will help us resolve those issues then keep, keep the zoning as best we can and the rules of the game in place so we don't confuse the development community. Those are my thoughts. So, Mayor Council, I make the motion that we reject, decline to adopt Ordinance 2015-44, rezone approximately 37.9 acres of Grove, mixed housing subdistrict to the Grove commercial sales subdistrict on property located approximately 100 south. 1650 West and at approximately 1450 West State Street in the Grove Mixed Housing Sub District. So that is my motion. And I'll second it. We have a motion to deny by Ben and, and a second by Diana by voice. Sid? Yes. Eric? Yes. Cindy? Yes. Diana? Yes. And yes, unanimous. Uh, it's denied. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate everyone for the input and the insight. I hope it fits the rest of the 35,000 people that we're not the bad guys. <laughs>Okay, the City Council, you'll recall back in August we had a, a, a same or a similar type of motion coming forward to you that uh, amended the requirements for both in the RR zone and then separately uh, in all the R1 or the single family residential zones requirements for accessory structures. As we approved both of those and moved forward, we realized in discussion uh, with uh, 
the applicant on one of them and some other people that were concerned that perhaps we missed an item. And that was in the RR zone, which is largely uh, rural in nature, that there are many situations where either there exists or a property owner would like to create an accessory structure that is not necessarily um, related to the residential portion of their property. It is more agricultural in, uh, in its nature and it uh, oftentimes can be set back significantly from uh, the home itself. And so what we put into place previously was uh, architectural design requirements that require that the building, the accessory structure, have some matching architecture to the home. But in some of these situations, that may not make sense. If there is a barn, uh, a facility that houses animals or is uh, not necessarily related to the accessory needs of the resident, but it's or the residents, but it's more related to the agricultural nature of the property, that to imp uh, apply those type of uh, design requirements did not make sense. So uh, with that, David, if you'll forward to the next one. The proposed addition uh, verbiage that uh, is brought forward is uh, such as on the screen. Accessory buildings located 75 feet or further from any surrounding dwelling as measured from the dwelling to the nearest side of the accessory structure are not required to meet the design requirements in section 10.9.8.F.3.D. Uh, basically, as I uh, explained it earlier, that there needed to be some matching uh, design. <laughs> so 75 feet is a number that uh, was chosen because we do have another section in the code right now that uh, has special requirements for uh, animal structures, structures that house animals that they need to be 75 feet from a residence. So it seemed to make sense that this is the, the proper distance where uh, design requirements would not be uh, in place. So. With that, uh, staff is recommending approval. Planning Commission reviewed this at their last meeting and had unanimously re recommended approval. Any questions? Questions from staff? Okay, why don't we open it up to the public then? If anyone has comments on this or questions, please come up and state your name and address. <clears throat> I'm Chris Eager, uh, 4638 North, 900 West. Um, I think I'm one of the people that's the reason for this. Um, so I'm trying to get an accessory building built about, I don't know, just haven't measured it from the house, a couple hundred feet. And I have the ugliest house on the road. You guys don't want me to match that. Um, <laughs> it's yellow brick, you know, Wayne Cornerby. I don't know what he was thinking, but it was cool in the 60s. Um, but we're trying to build you know, just a red shop to match our barn and our shed. Um, and anyway, so I've been trying to get the permit going and then I got told that this was something in the way. So I'm hoping to dig footings tomorrow, um, depending on how this goes. But anyway, I don't think it's a big deal. But um, anyway, so that just, you know, we're trying to, to keep the farm look. Um, like I say, he's got, you know, the, the way the house was built, it's got kind of a Mexican style to it. It's, not my style, but um, I'll, work on that. I'll work on that later. But we're just trying to get this this you know accessory building built. And just like you to consider that. Thank you. Questions, comments, concerns. Good patience. So I'm trying. Agricultural side, right? The R R side. R R. Anyone else related to him? <laughs> Okay, if not, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back up here. Any further discussion? Go ahead. motion. We move the city council approve the request of Pleasant Grove City for a text amendment to the city code section 10 9 a 8 Care requirements modifying accessory during requirements in the RR rural residential chapter of Pleasant Grove City Code. I'll second. I'll we have a motion by Eric, a second by Diana. Ben? Yes. Sid? Yes. Eric? Yes. Cindy? Yes. yes. Motion carries. Well, we'll start building. 
All right. Item 10A is to consider for approval the request of Jackson Jones of the two lot subdivision. Go, see, go like three more. Two lot final subdivision <coughs> known as Loader Estates Flat B, approximately 2.25 acres on property located at approximately 450 South 1100 East in the R19 single family zone and agricultural overlay. Okay, Dave, go ahead and go to the next one. Um, Mayor and City Council, uh, within the last couple of years, we've been working with Jackson Jones on his property, and you'll recall it was about two years ago that we have had applied onto his property, which is outlined in blue here, uh, the rural agricultural overlay. So he is in the R19 zone with this overlay. So it allows him to have uh, <coughs> agricultural uses uh, within this uh, framework of the, the overlay. So he has uh, the, the minimum required acreage, acreage for the overlay is two acres. He has a uh, little more than that, and he would like to divide out of that a, a lot, a building lot uh, in the R19 uh, zone. And there is uh, just to the north of that, we've recently approved this, the Pleasant Heights subdivision, which is taking in all this property. Uh, construction has started on that. Um, so there's a road that will go right up against his property on the north side and then eventually plan to continue through his property at some point in the future uh, to connect uh, through here. So there'll be that kind of a road connection going through there. Um, so he would like to divide out. So let's go to the next slide. Um, well, well, a few of them. So, okay, well, back up. So there's uh, the plat that he's proposing for his property. Uh, to in this location divide out a, a lot that will have frontage on uh, the planned road that or the road that's being developed in this area and then again we'll at some point connect down through there so this lot will have frontage on onto that road so it does leave a little bit of a, a, a funny shape here as he's proposing it uh, he's wanting to have this access that's 30 feet wide to access the back of this property through here I'll just explain my concerns with how this is uh, being brought forward. Um, go ahead to the next slide. David. We have uh, approved uh, Pleasant Grove City vicinity plans. That's uh, uh, a part of our plan development and uh, ref referenced in our code that uh, we need to have vicinity plans for development in the area. This is a vicinity plan that was put into place prior to the Pleasant Heights development that is up in this area north of Jackson Jones property. So the actual vicinity plan is more of a suggestion of how a future property can develop um, in that area, but uh, without another plan, uh, the uh, that is that is the plan that will be followed until something else is approved. So there's a slightly modified version of, of this uh, area plan uh, that was approved with the Pleasant Heights. And you go to the next slide just show you what their subdivision plan was through here. So the road uh, on our plan showed kind of going through here. They dropped it down a little bit and it was approved with these cul-de-sacs here with the extension of a roadway to connect through here at some future point. So it's this lot right here that uh, Jack and Jones were able to subdivide out of the rest. Now, again, these lines right here are just for future road consideration, not an actual subdivision at this point. It's only this piece right here that he is proposing to. Uh, subdivide out of the rest. Um, but uh, because uh, we we have a concern for future development and the vicinity plans uh, of, for future development, we have this proposal this is going in and out. I apologize. Um, by doing this, uh, what, what it ends up doing is creating a situation where this could possibly become a flag lot. That is not a part of our plan with the vicinity plans to have any flag lots, and that is considered a last work, last resort development option. Uh, we would like to see all uh, lots front onto a road, uh, a, a through road for number one priority, uh, then as a second priority onto a cul-de-sac, and as a third priority, uh, a flag lot. So we would prefer not to see planning for a flag lot here. 
uh, and we have discussed this with Jackson, and he has told us that uh, it is not his intention at this time to create a flag lot. However, it's my concern that if we go ahead and approve it as uh, as he's proposing it, it's setting us up for into the future, looking at uh, development options for that, that it would make natural sense to just go ahead and create a line right here and make this a flag lot. And then this uh, one would front onto that road, this one onto there. So uh, my concern is that it might be better to just shove that over, get rid of that access there, create the lot right here. Um, so that has been staff's recommendation that he move the lot lines and eliminate that 30 foot access. He has chosen to not do that. And he, uh, I'm sure will want to come up and support his reasoning for that. Uh, so staff recommends, uh, well, let me back up. Planning Commission uh, has recommended approval of this plat, uh, even though uh, there was a suggestion from them that the lot lines be brought forward or brought over to the west, eliminating that access. Um, staff will also recommend approval of the plat with strong recommendation that the lot lines be moved. Um, the applicant is asking that you approve it as shown and back it up. Um, yeah, one more. <coughs> yeah, right there. So that's representation of the final plat area of his property. <coughs> Any can questions? Can you go back to the previous slide? That so, one? Why the need for the road if it's a cul-de-sac right there? Uh, there be, unless, are you talking about this going to be? Well, at this point, this is going to be a cul-de-sac. But at some future point, there's the ability to connect that roadway to uh, the 1100 east at this that comes up to right here. But at, the, at this, at, if if Jackson chose to at some future point uh, to further subdivide his property, he would lose the designation of the agricultural overlay. But he'd have the ability to subdivide and create new lots. And by so doing, this would be a road extension that would be required. Yeah, my legs are asleep. We gotta move. <laughs> <coughs> so that's about it. There's questions. I mean, that's the that's the proposal. That's what I'd like to do. You subdivide out. It's like 0.23. I think it's about the size. Yeah, and then just have. Why don't like staff's recommendation of shifting the lot over to I'm gonna throw my wife underneath the bus. <laughs> the the way I want to set my lot. If it's my final lot, I was raised here in Pleasant Grove, born here. I would like to have that. I don't want to have an alleyway back down to the bottom part of that pasture. I'd like to have it look like a house, be pretty. And for my, the way I would like it and the way my wife would like to see it work, that's just what we want to do with it. You know, animal rights, right? animal rights and stuff. And, you know, it's what we'd like to do. I mean, it's just the way we have our vision set of the property. Like you said, I have no intentions of doing the flag lot because I can't have less than two acres or else I lose what I've. I mean, we've gone through this, I think it's like four or five years. We've tried to get it on there and everything. So we finally got a way to get the animal rights on it. And then we came up with this design, and that's how we'd like to do it. And, I mean, I'm planning on being there for life, so that's just how we're going to leave it. <laughs> Put the drone in. Cut it out. No, but um, we acquired the piece of property. We really liked it, and me and Haley put a lot of thought into it. And... I know it may make more sense to move that down there, but our future vision of it, where we want our house and how we want the layout and how we're going to use the land, for my uses, that makes better sense for me. I mean, and, and they told me about the flag lot and how I think they can say it doesn't quite meet the specifications of a flag lot, and that's fine with me because I'm not, that's not my intentions. <coughs> so if it's passed and I can't develop later on because it, it was my fault, then I accept that and I'm not planning on it. So. Where are you looking? So that you could build on that lot, and then right next to it on the right, if I build a home, I would build it right there. And I'd like to leave the, it's an old orchard, so I'd like to leave as much trees in the way it is right now. I mean, there's a lot of animals that are in there, and a lot of people like the deer that come in and out, the quail and stuff. So if I build my house, I'd like to do as least damage to it as possible and kind of keep it as it is. You know, clean it up, obviously, make it look pretty, but. The hole is just oh, about two and a quarter. So two and a quarter. So we'll be just, we'll be like 2.02, 2.01, something like that. 
So it'll maintain that minimum requirement for the overlay. So I'm not, I'm confused. So yeah. this uh, is not your lot. There we go. This one? Uh -huh. That's my lot. Okay. And then I own this lot too. So you're going to build your house right here. Without if I build, I don't even know. I might just keep it as is so this for a long a time. Yeah. If I lose you as a neighbor, then. But my my, <laughs> my my intentions are to keep it as an agricultural overlay because in Pleasant Grove, animal rights are hard to establish. They're hard to keep. Unfortunately, it's kind of gone that way. I, I know proctors aren't here anymore, but they have something that's kind of unique to Pleasant Grove. They still have that. Haley and I wanted to find a place to keep it in Pleasant Grove because we like being here. And this was the way we could do it. You couldn't buy this property without having an overlay on it. So it's got to remain for us to have our horses and to enjoy what we like at Pleasant Grove. So why, tell me again, explain, sorry. why This right here? Yeah, that. So why don't you just move that down? I want to have access back here, you know, for drive a truck or drive a trailer. Um, I want to make it look nice, of course, fence, whatnot. I did that. But instead of parking a trailer right by the side of my house, <laughs> which if Haley was here, she would say no way. I would like to maintain the look of my house, but have things over here, not trash. I'm not going to make it a, a, a junkyard or anything, but sometimes it's nice to have your house look the way it is, you know, and not have some things parked there or access. If I had to go in and um, dig something up, I don't want to go through here. You know, if I want to take a tractor in to till things up, to level it out, something like that. I don't want to go through my driveway. I don't want to go through where, up where my house is. I want access, more utility to be able to go in and do things. And it makes sense rather than having like my house, a driveway through here. It just doesn't look the way we'd like. And I don't want to, I can't put anything up here because of this. I wouldn't want to drive all the way around. Same thing right here. I don't, I want these guys not to see just, or I'd rather have it just grass so they have a pretty view. It's not something that they have to complain about. So it makes more sense for me to have this as an axe. It doesn't hurt. This neighbor here, I've spoken with her. The boundary lines are good and doesn't affect Sid Lamone or anything. So it's just more for the way I want to use Let's the. Let's talk about these neighbors for a second here. Right sure. gonna... These ones? <laughs> <laughs> so, so for my use and for the way I'd like to keep my house and the way my ground, I would like it to maintain. For my uses, it just makes sense for me. Can you just go to planning commission? Yes, it did. And they, they, they approved it. And they, they brought the same concern. And I think, I know the concern is, hey, this is going to be a flag lock later on. But again, I'm my hands are kind of tied with the agricultural overlay that I want. I can't do that. So that's why I told them my intentions are not to do that. And I agreed to put my house here so it doesn't interfere with this roadway. So I, I've kind of agreed to PG City's recommendations, as in we don't want you to mess with the future development of the city. So would you please, you know, Say that you'll put your house here, and I agreed that, and I agree I'm not going to do a flag, flag lot right there, you know, and to maintain the overlay. So I felt like I've given my due diligence, but I'd also like to have my freedom on my ground to kind of design it the way I would like, which is kind of seems to be kind of a, I guess, a forerunner, a theme of tonight. <laughs> but any other questions? Sorry. Nothing? It's good. Okay. Any further discussion? If I could kind of answer some questions, just kind of walk me through <coughs> walk me through those different hypothetical scenarios. What happens if the agricultural overlay goes away in 20 years and then we have right. market revolve? Right. So so I, I hear exactly what uh, Jackson is saying, and so as long as he into perpetuity owned the land, then we probably wouldn't have concern. What happens in the case that uh, he decides or is forced to or who knows what the situation is, but he is no longer the future owner of that property. Then the future owner comes and asks to sub subdivide the property further uh, and does not care to lose the agricultural overlay uh, designation. And now we have that uh, little 30 foot access and it only makes sense to create a flag lock there. Uh, there are some provisions of our flag lot ordinance that it does not meet, and so we would have to make some adjustments to do that uh, to allow for flag lot to occur. But um, I'm just thinking 10, 15 years down the road when none of us are here 
and someone else owns the property and they come forward and they go, well, I'd like to subdivide it. And the, the staff and the council and planning commission kind of scratch their heads and go, what were they thinking when they did this? Why did they create this funny narrow 30 foot? And nobody has an answer to it. You know, well, okay, we can go back to the files. We can probably find the answer. But it's it's just going to be a situation where, okay, well, did that make sense? Why, why did that occur? So I, I'm just thinking it down the road, should Jackson not own the property, we might end up creating a flag line there. Can I ask on access, that piece of property there, does that have access? Is that a field? Is that, is that, so, sorry, I don't it know. Is, it is an individual parcel. <laughs> <laughs> it is a landlocked parcel. That, that, right that's not an individual parcel. parcel. That's our house, the backyard. That's our soccer. Okay, but it's a separate lot. It is a separate lot. Okay. It's not so, a separate lot. It's because it's only it was a fence line agreement with Leo Alt. And you have under one property tax that's paid that's for under parcel. Yeah, it's and not it's, separate. It's, it's separate. under one mortgage that's combined at the home. There was a fence line agreement according to Leo and Virginia Alt that's for the right. purpose for you to have a bigger backyard. That's correct. So we bought it from Leo after we built our home several years after. I just know there's uh, different descriptions for it on the county records. And so my question is, 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 is well, it should be, it should just be more because we adjusted that several years ago. Okay, because well maybe for some reason we're not showing that with our city records. That, that wasn't my question. <laughs> <laughs> right here, how how does this uh, area develop with road access, regardless of whether that's here or here pushed over? How would that eventually well, be developed? That that would at. You know, um, most likely just be a deep lot that would be accessed on this road right here. Okay, so, so you know, they can put a lot or two here, a right. lot here, and then they might just have to be one big lot there. Right. I mean, because really there's no other way to get road access. You, there's there's not a way to split it right there, really, that, unless there is a black lot um, access asked for, whenever that, if that ever happens. But... <coughs> Pretty much, I mean, somebody develops that, that takes that away anyway. But I, I was just curious how that was going to develop, and regardless. Okay. Uh, did you have something else you wanted to add? Yeah, one more, if it's all right. Yeah. So I, I remember, like, when we first started the process a long time ago. And this is kind of how I got the idea of it. We had to show the vicinity plot map. And this was with John Oscarson before this was sold down here. We kind of had this idea that, say, this property person was in agreement, this one and this one. This was a way to get it all developed. That's kind of how it originated. But that's not going to happen. We have no agreement and no intended agreement <coughs> upon ever, you know, joining land or anything like that. That's just not going to happen. But... For me, in my own purposes, say I broke my leg or for some reason I had fear of <coughs> phobia of horses or whatnot, this would become, you know, can't get the flag lot, whatever. And even there's no way to get a road in here to do the lots without, you know, making a big agreement. So based on what I can do for myself, if it were me and my house was here or whatnot, you've got a lot here, a lot here, a lot here, and a lot here. And this is deep, but kind of skinny. So it creates access to a back for someone that had a, a long lot. Which in mind makes some like sense. A, so you're saying that you say this, this were to would, happen, this would be the frontage to the road. Yes. So house this is facing here. This would be a back access because it is a long lot, which would make that a more marketable lot to some that would say, "Oh, there is a back access in there." So I have a question. Yeah. Why are you subdividing it all? Why don't you just build a house where you want it? It's all about the almighty dollar. Um. <laughs> you, you are planning to sell that one lot. Right? This I've, I've got some that's. An idea to buy it. You got a friend, and that's kind of the thing. I'm not in a hurry to sell it, but it does have, you know. So you're trying to sell this one would be gone oh. if I sold. I'm a school teacher. Unfortunately, I can't build a million dollar house right there. School teaching funds aren't that great. But anyways, <laughs> but anyways, this is, for all intents and purposes, this was the best plan. I best plan for me and my wife that we found that we could, you know use our property and still keep Pleasant Grove in a way that's pretty. I've had a lot of neighbors express like, oh, that'd be a great a great place to see. One, the lots will be bigger if it ever developed, but also a lot of the neighbors are excited to keep the orchard. I mean, this is all, this is all open space. 
you got, you know, orchards over here. They're excited to keep it open like it is, you know, for the time being as I'm there, unless I die in a tragic death or something. But anyways. <laughs> hey, you never know. <laughs> I've been at this for three years and here for like two and a half hours. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> So, Any questions? Yeah, me. So, this lot right here, I don't know why I'm so confused tonight. You're going to nope. not build here. I would sell that. And you're going to build help build here. my shack. And yeah. you're going to build <coughs> Yeah. So, that's where I would put a building lot right there. And it wouldn't interfere with later development. But then you would access the strip right here, or would that be theirs? The little strip? Yeah. That would be mine. It's just access to bring utility in the back. If I ever wanted to bring a tractor in to do something, that type of deal. It's really odd. It is odd, but I'm kind of odd. <laughs> You're going to have to deal with me up there, I guess. Any other questions? And this meets the zoning? Yes. This lot, this yep, it does. It meets the minimum requirements past the planning commission. <laughs> Weird, but makes sense. At least to me. It's super odd. There's not a lot of people that would want a property in the middle of their property that wasn't their nope. property. <laughs> but with the fence and an alleyway, you know. It's This issue isn't on the agenda as a public hearing, but I, if there are members of the public that want to comment on it, I wouldn't mind hearing from them. <coughs> Trustee Nelson's open to that. Council? Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. If there's anyone that would like to comment on this from the council or from the public, please come up and state your name and address, and we'll hear you. Wayne Thatcher, 120 North, 1400 East. Um, it's an interesting discussion to watch. Um, I, uh, for one, completely understand this man's request. It makes complete sense to me. And uh, so uh, I would hope we would uh, entertain his needs uh, in deference to some really far out there future possibilities that might be in the city's interest. Uh, I would I would side with property rights and uh, this man's needs and desires. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Sure. Michael Butt, 936 North, 1420 West. So as I'm looking at this situation, I'm just curious. Is the is the proposed um, back way? Is that cement, asphalt? What is the little alleyway? Yeah, just you know, grass. Just grass. Yeah, just be able so to drive over it. It's just like a side like I don't, I don't want to make it. I don't want to make it look like a lot. I don't want to make it look like a flag lot. It's just an access. Just okay, grass. so we're not talking about it, that. It, that it even be no. a road that would have no. to be dug up because I, I was looking at it the same way. No, not like a road. Talking about you know oh what might happen twenty years down the line, well, I mean even if it were a cemented thing, couldn't that be dug up and the lines realigned there, and that lot could just be extended? I mean, it doesn't appear to be anything major from my point of view, and I agree with going with the current owner's property rights. Yeah, I think the staff is trying to plan for the future with all possibilities and. Okay, hey, anybody else? Hello. Um, I'm had on this parcel right okay. here, I'm Angela sorry. Tandy Trammell, and I own this parcel right here. Uh, this parcel that the, the property that we're all talking about has been in my family since 1862. And it was actually 150, this is the last part of the property from, um, it was granted by Ulysses S. Grant to my uh, my grandfathers. <coughs> Anyways, so 
Jackson Jones now has acquired the back of this property um, after I split it off from other family members, and he's a family member of a fam of one of my family members. Anyhow, so I'm like, however that works. I, I'd like to, if it's a deacon, a deacon, I, I'd like him to go back to those like future proposed uh, maps of like, you know, oh, do you have the ability to do that? So this is an existing home right here. And I'm really confused as how to that would even, how, how anyone would even have the forethought of, you know, is it back? They modified it. That's not the current plan. They modified it for the new subdivision. So there's another one that has the current okay. plan. Okay. Yeah. 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 This really doesn't do bother me for him to have that accessory in the back there. Anybody else? Okay, let's come back up here then. Any further discussion? I'll uh, make a motion for please. Mr. Avery. Quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, <laughs> I make a motion to request the approval. Jackson Jones with two lot plan provision of no, as known as Lord of Street's Top B, Top Scale 2.27 acres, on property located at approximately 450 South Long Terrace on the R19, Swing County Residential Zone and Residential Outdoor Portal Overlay. Second. 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 Before we go forward, I I would like to change my vote on if this is possible happening there. On agenda item nine A, the the Grove Mix Housing Sub District. This other one, Sid and Eric, she just changed her vote. 
So, Senator Marbo on the uh, two lap subdivision at Perry. Okay. The next item is 10B. It's to consider for approval a request from Lorraine Herrera to extend the final plat approval for a two lot subdivision known as Lorraine's Place Plat A, located at approximately 565 East 300 North for one year. Okay, Mayor and City Council, uh, last year in December, you approved uh, in this location <coughs> 300 North, uh, a flag lot subdivision, which, go ahead in the next one. Uh, this was the final plat that was approved by City Council to create a flag lot in this location. Uh, the applicant Lorraine Herrera is here and she'll uh, answer to any questions that you may have on this. Uh, there were no concerns with this plat and it was approved. Uh, and uh, what she has at this time is an approved plat that uh, has not been uh, completely uh, finalized as far as um, the, was it the, re the recording has not occurred on that. So um, she uh, has a few things that she'll need to accomplish with that. Uh, but she doesn't have the time now to do that uh, before the expiration, which occurs in one year after approval. Is it procedural? Yes, it's procedural. We have no concerns with the, the continuance of the approval of this, but it is uh, a housekeeping item to, to do so. Any questions? Any discussion? Can I let her can a motion? I'll make the motion that we approve the request of Lorraine Herrera to extend the final plan approval for a two-month subdivision known as Lorraine's Place, Flat, A, located at 1365 East 300 North for one year. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion by Cindy, uh, Cindy <coughs> and Diana. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I need it. Three <laughs> hours for that. Well, hopefully, a year will give you a little more time to get the things that you need to do. Yeah, I think I might have to build my own house on it. <laughs> All right. Item 10C is to consider for adoption resolution 2015 037, authorizing the mayor to declare 30 desktop computers and 15 laptops as surplus and direct they be disposed of according to the city's policy. We're disposing of surplus property. Uh, we have a, a computer replacement program that we uh, put in in the city a few years back where we would uh, rotate, I want to say it's every four years, um, our computers as far as uh, uh, updating and, and getting new computers. The ones that we have uh, after the end of the four years, then we surplus them and uh, dispose of them via our policy. So in order for us to do that, uh, the council needs to approve the declaration of surplus. Any questions? That's what this list is. Or is that a list? You mean in your packet is there a yeah. list of the computers? Did you put a list in there? I, I just see the resolution. I don't see a list. I don't know if we put a list in there. What do you plan on doing with the surplus? Surplus computers, uh, we give the employees an opportunity to buy their computer from the city. Um, and then uh, if there is value in the others, uh, Jeremy, our uh, IT guy, is the one that uh, markets them, tries to get any value. The ones that don't have value, we dispose of and, and try to you know, dispose of the computers. Not as easy as it used to be. You have to go through special steps now. So, when employees buy them, do they buy them at the uh, cost, at the value of time of acquisition? What's the no, the value, uh, the current value of the computer. So Jeremy does research and pulls them up. They do pay a fee to have it wiped clean. So to, in essence, we erase the, the hard drive and take any information off there. Um, and then the, 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 yeah, so they pay that and then whatever the, the value is. Discussion? 
It's kind of a round structure. Let's see. Kind of a random question, but if you have a computer replacement policy that rotates them a specific every four years, is there a reason why we also need to surplus them? We asked ourselves the same question, and, and I don't know if we just need to make it part of our policy that this is how we're going to dispose of them each year, so that every year we don't need to cut back and declare them surplus. So uh, we'll 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 put something together for the council to approve, so that um, we don't have to go through this step right here. It's pretty straightforward what we do. Do we have all of our computers on the same four-year cycle, or are they staggered? So we no, they're staggered. Yeah. Um, so the, I mean, we'll do the police computers one year, and then we'll. Do certain office staff, and I, I, I mean, initially when we started the program, we had computers that were you know, eight years old, and people couldn't open files and access Word or whatever because their computer was too old. And so we decided we'd kind of get with the times a little bit and give somebody a, a functioning computer so they could do their jobs. And wow, that was the program we created. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. And so we buy them about right now on our lease. Well, we buy them on a four-year uh, rotation, so I think we pay them through the our lease uh, payment or our lease that we do each year. We buy the computers through that, and then the the amount of funds is roughly the same because we're just expending that same amount to to rotate the computers. If that makes sense, it's like our police cars. We we do them on a rotation. It is a lease. Capital lease, dollar buyout kind of thing. Capital lease with ownership once we're done paying. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. Here I'll make a motion to adopt the resolution 2015-037, authorizing the mayor to declare 30 desktop computers and 15 laptops. A surplus and <coughs> disposed of according to the city policy. <coughs> Motion by Eric. Second. Second by Diana. <laughs> ben? Yes. Sid? Yes. Eric? Yes. Somebody's not in. Well, I, I get it, but I better not go. Okay. Abstain. Uh, Diana? Yes. Okay. Motion carries. All right. Um, the next section is items for discussion with possible action, and we can take public comment if needed. Um, item <coughs> A is a discussion on the tentative fiscal year 2016 UTA Transportation Authority budget. Um, I received in the mail a tentative budget from UTA with all of the discussion that I experienced this last wonderful six months about uh, what was going on with UTA and the <coughs> budgets, um, I did not wish to sign anything related to our comment without having the city council comment on this and possibly even the public. Um, there should be a copy of this in your packet and I will open it up for discussion. Um, just so you know, at the end of this, there is a, a signature sheet that was pre-filled out. All it's looking for is name, title, and dates. But it reads, I, so-and-so representing such and such, have read, received a copy of the UTA's tentative budget for FY16, have reviewed the budget as required by section 17B-1-702, Utah Anarchy annotated and have no comment or objection to the budget as presented. <coughs> Comments? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> but um, this is a, a large packet. I I tried to peruse it. I'm skeptical of that term, and so I'm, I um, there is a lot of stuff to take in here. I have not been a part of the meeting. I would, um, I'd love to find out what you remember. <coughs> I've perused this. I have not studied it. Okay. So, question: Is there a reason it's on the agenda right now? Because there's still public hearings coming up for the tentative budget. Um, so, is there a reason it's being discussed now, prior to the public hearings, where maybe more information?
information given at that time. This says there's a that's a public hearing receive input will take place on Wednesday, November 18th at 2 30. Right. But that's not our that's not our government's input. That's <coughs> everybody. But but could that influence hearing from the public? Could that influence how we so I think the public's invited to uh, to go out to Salt Lake. Yeah, yeah, there's a meeting in Salt Lake. Everybody has to go to Salt Lake. They can give their opinion in Salt Lake, and by then the opportunity for this body to have actually discussed anything, sign anything, and give it back to them, <coughs> including comments, will have passed. And so you have tonight to discuss, and I think next week, Tuesday. And then the following day, which is the 18th, and the day we meet. <coughs> so this is our just resign it because this is just our blind acceptance. Of. Well, that's the issue for me. I, I'm uncomfortable, and and I don't want to represent our city one way or the other without having everyone's input into this. I have issues with. I have issues with the overall way that uh, the finances of UTA are working. I have questions. I have concerns. <coughs> uh, have you never been requested to <coughs> sign off on their budget before? And right. So, um, so what is the goal? Well, I don't, I don't know. This is the first I've heard of it, but I'm assuming that... Can I not afford it to or the staff. <coughs> I got it. I, 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 I saw the copy of, the, of what you received. So, so I don't know. Has it had a chance to review it? It's just been in the packet. Well, I so it, I, I didn't get any background info. Like, I don't know where it came from, why they're asking us to look at it. Did any of that come up in the other discussion? No. That's why I'm concerned. I see. But what? They're not even giving any explanation why we need to be signing off on a UTA budget. This is going on by the citizens. Well, the citizens have <coughs> input. I'm, first off, at this point, that they give us just a one meeting and nothing down here on the town. I am talking. not advocating <laughs> this bill. <okay? laughs> I am bringing this to your attention so trying to understand and, it. and trying to understand it at the same time as you. Well, so, so, for example, um, at the very first uh, meeting when we were talking about the two taxes to increase road funding in the state, <coughs> we approved uh, to put on the ballot a version of that without the UTA component. So I was very surprised when on the ballot there was a the UTA component to that. Um, I do not feel comfortable signing in. <coughs> is the verbiage? I have no comments. Or yeah, specifically, we have no objection. I have no idea. Okay. So, I guess my analysis would be twofold. One, we need to figure out, and Tina needs some time to digest it, but we need to know what happens if we refuse to sign. And then we want, we want to craft some response and say, we do have objection comment. The legislative performance audit of UTA is not complementary to UTA's handling of money. Past, they have made some efforts to try to improve things, but there's no assurance that they have. And so, I wouldn't. I, I think I compliment you, Mayor, for raising the issue and being not willing to sign that as written and to bring it to our attention that they're requesting us to do that. I think we need to know what happens if we don't sign it, um, what the impact is, and then I would love to come up with some language with the public and with the members of this council to say. This is what I want to tell you today. <laughs> so I could have some fun with that. So, for example, <laughs> business solutions 8.9 8. million technology network and applications. I have no idea what that is. I don't know what. Okay. It, it, on the signature sheet, it does say in the second sentence I reviewed the kind of budget as required by section 17E 1 702 Utah Code Annotator. And I have no comment or objection to this budget. So, I mean, when I read that and they're asking for this is sent to the mayor, that they're asking <coughs> for a signature, and I read that it's something from 
Utah code annotated. I mean, that would indicate to me that somewhere the legislature has required cities to sign off on UTA's budget or at least give comments. So, is this yeah, a new rule? No, that's what I'm looking at. So, in 2014, that code section simply requires it to submit to each of its constituent <clears throat> entities, each of its customer <clears throat> agencies that have requested a, in writing a copy of the governor <clears throat> and the legislature. A copy of their tentative budget. And the local district shall include with the tentative budget a signature sheet that includes language that the constituent entity or customer agency received the tentative budget and has no objection to it. And that's all. So the additional language <coughs> that's in there doesn't appear to be required by the statute. So I, I would like an opportunity to. Look into this before you guys make a decision as to whether or not you want to sign up. Sure. And in the meantime, there's also the contact. Because if by the time you come back next week, Tuesday, and tell us the answer to that question, I'd like to understand whether or not the council's in favor of the content or not. And if we have comments. <coughs> so then you craft something. I'll, I'll put together some language. Let's read it. Lots of comments. Read it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's just continue this till next time. It was just a discussion. So, Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to have your continue. That was just a discussion. This discussion. <laughs> so, we'll put it on next week's agenda. And then, Tina, you'll let us know if we do actually have a requirement. And then, Council, hopefully, you'll have comments that will give you. That will give them <coughs> specific specifics on what our I mean, thoughts are. I think there was some confusion about the way the council speak committee to voted for Prop One earlier this summer. We voted to give the people a chance to vote on as elected, well, as elected officials. We voted to give the citizen a chance to go on the ballot, take the moving and UTA funding portion. Correct. That's not what was relayed to a lot of people in the public. So I want right. to make sure, for the record, that's what happened. Yeah, I think that was not completely clear. Yeah. So well, the, and resolution one, but the resolution did have sections that indicated that those that voted for it wanted the public to support that proposition. That came up with that. I think the record ought to reflect that to be accurate. Because <coughs> All right, so item 11B is to consider for approval a change order number two. And payment request number eight for SNL Inc. for Shannon Field Softball Complex Phase Two. Marty? <coughs> no, we have David. Where's David? For Mr. Water, water. Is this done? My goodness. Did it work? No, I need the one that's in the pattern. Is that the one from the projector? Let's see. I just need to change the name. I didn't. Actually, over here. That's all I got. We're good. Can you turn off that light again? Up the front here. It work today. Hey, there we go. <coughs> Mayor, Council, good to be here. Uh, kind of at the conclusion of this year long project, it seems. We're at the very uh, end. This is the final. This is the final approval of everything. So uh, I believe the notice to proceed, I looked at that today, November 25th of 2014. So we're going on one year. Um, there were a lot of things that happened, and 
And I thought it'd be good to just show a couple of pictures. I'll go through them pretty quick just to give, to give you where we're at. So this was back in 2004. I remember being invited to come play some softball over here by, that's when I started in Pleasant Grove, really focusing on Pleasant Grove City. And so I came over and played with some of the guys from Public Works and had a great time on these old fields and the short fields and a really sandy kind of gravelly infields. I remember that stuff. Since that time, you can also see that the underpass still went under the railroad tracks at that time. I love that trestle, by the way. <laughs> that is now gone. And in 2000, I believe it was about 2008, 2007, 2008, we constructed phase one. And that's kind of what we ended up with at the end of that project. We had two fields that were constructed, a big open field. Um, still pretty much the same over at the rodeo grounds. We did um, kind of level out this area here and this area for parking. And that was taken from the extension of the, we did not take care of I don't know how we paid for that. Uh, from the extension. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay. So now, um, just a couple of construction pictures. So this is kind of what it looked like before construction, looking kind of to the southeast. Um, this is kind of midway through construction. You can see we got some of the infield going in. We've, we've got a light pole there ready to be set. Um, this is a pressure irrigation filter for the, for the irrigation to the park. Um, this is getting a little bit closer, getting ready to put in the fencing. Again, I try to get all of them from the same perspective so you can kind of see it develop there. We've got the lights up now. And, Sorry. and this is kind of the finished, <laughs> one of the finished products for, product from, the, from that same perspective. But kind of looking from the other end, this is kind of what we're looking at today. This was taken today, actually, um, from up on where the detention basin is. So beautiful project. Um, every project comes with its fun things to deal with and and I would I would say that even though we're sitting here in November and it's been a year a large majority of this project was done in the middle of July we uh, we have a 60 day period of once they put the landscaping in that the contractor is required to maintain that landscaping weed it bow it take care of it we had final walkthroughs that we had to come in and fill in gaps and cracks that were in the sod um, I'd mess with all of the electrical. Um, we had to deal with uh, sprinklers and things that weren't working. So there's that time period, and we're kind of here now finalizing. Contractors submitted their final payment. We've addressed all issues, and we've, we've had to go through some issues with that. I wanted to talk. <coughs> so I, I quickly just put in there these three things. So 2004, 2009, and now 2015. So we're pretty much there, and I, I'm glad I've been a part of seeing the development of this from nothing to, uh, I think, a great facility, something that is, is going to be well used by the citizens, um, and hopefully beautiful and, and, and kept up. Um, a couple of the things in the change order, so there's two things that we're looking at tonight, the change order and then the final the application to SNL. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple of the things to help you understand some of the costs. So the, the, as you go through construction, and one of the things I think we discussed at that meeting is that you're going to have change orders with almost any project. There are things that are not seen. There are things that are just added to, hey, we, we need to take care of this problem. Let's do this now. And that was done throughout this project. One of the things, this is a unit bid price. So understand that it's not a fixed price on any of the project. It was if you install more, then you get paid that unit price that you agreed to for the additional quantity. So road base is one of those things that was a little bit surprising on the amount, uh, but we did our best <coughs> to try to get the contractor to where we thought it was fair. He gave a little bit, we gave a little bit, and, and we, we really didn't have uh, you know this $32,000 difference in that cost. Um, that is the increased amount above that. So that would be that maybe the grade was slightly lower and they brought in a little bit more material um, to kind of bring it up to the final grade before we paved or something of that nature. We went through and, and spent probably too much time trying to figure out where all of this came from. In the end, because it is a unit bid price, we had a difficult time saying, 
uh, you know, you aren't justified this cost. We did get value out of it. We did get additional base. We did get ad additional structural value out of it. And that's one of the items that, that um, caused some of the increased cost. Um, another thing that was added right at um, 220 South, um, if you look at this, if this is up in this area right here. This cross gutter um, in the original design, it was just planned to flow across on the asphalt. We've only got a little bit of area. It's all the way up around this corner, but this area flows down through here. As we started looking at that design of that, we felt that the best thing to do would get to, to put a cross gutter there, make it so that the water isn't going to cause the asphalt to fell through that area. And so at that time, as we looked at that and the contractor was ready to go, we had to make a decision on whether or not a cross gutter was installed. That's one of the other things that was added. Um, two field light poles, we had one issue. Um, um, right here, these two light poles here, there is a storm drain line that runs underneath State Street. It comes through this box right here that's in the concrete. It extends out to this box. It's here in 500 South. And it was unknown. It's down there about 14 or 15 feet. It's down a ways. And we didn't know if we were going to, we thought we were clear of that as we drilled the holes for the light poles, which are 13 foot deep. Um, it hit into the top of that pipe and damaged the pipe. And so we had to <coughs> dig down and, and uh, go through that process of making sure that was stable. So our light pole didn't tip over. And, and what we ended up having to do is actually relocate the light pole. So they had to drill a new hole and move the light pole that was on this field slightly to the south in order to get that to all look symmetrical as well as be in the right location to where we're not going to have future problems. Those are the types of things that you typically see in large projects. And that's why there's always, it seems like there's always change orders of some nature on projects that we do. Um, and then the last thing, uh, we had some areas of soft, um, we call them soft spots. Uh, a big area here in the parking lot was just clay and we couldn't get it stabilized. We brought in the bay. Well, we looked at it. We did some proof rolling before bringing in the base and it was determined that we needed to excavate that out further and backfill. And we also had to do a good section here along 500 South so that we are not having failing, failing pavement in the future. So that's uh those are some of the, the major items of the change order. Um, you have that all in your packet, kind of a summary of where that ended up. So the project budget amount um, was $1,570,649. Uh, the project cost increases are about 150,000, which is about 9.6% increase. I remember talking about generally 10% is your maximum that you see or about right around the where you, like, you don't like to see it exceed that. In this project, there were a lot of things that we dealt with and it ended up being about 9.6% increase, bringing the total project amount to $1,720,942. Um, there is still some uh, a couple of things, record drawings that we're waiting for, nothing with the contractor, a little bit with the engineering to finish up. Um, and so, but this does include the amounts anticipated for them to finish. Uh, the last thing and get the final project. So i um, willing to answer any questions you may have. And there's there's a lot of information there. So I've got a couple of quick ones. <coughs> we talked about the getting the line, putting the, the light poles. Do we have maps of where those lines lie? 13 working the end of the ground? Do we, how does so, that happen, I guess? So, yeah, no, a great question. And so you... As you look at the layout of the park and you, you say, okay, there's a box here, there's a box here, you draw a line in between and you assume that it's a straight line in between them. You never know if it's slightly out of line. And it looked like from the drawings that we were gonna be off to the side, the light was placed where it needed to be based on the design. It could have been shifted slightly during design, but that was the correct location. It matches the north fields as well. So we thought we were gonna miss it as we got good, you know, digging that hole, drilling the hole, it, you know, went right into the top of the pipe and then it was said, hey, we can't do anything other than relocate those light poles to a new location, so. The question I had, 
you mentioned the 5,550 tons of road base. <coughs> uh, what measures do we go through as a city to independently verify that there actually was that additional quantity installed? So they are required to submit every way ticket that they receive on the project. So every when they go and pick up material from a, a pit, either Geneva or um, some other pit, they will have a way ticket that says this is going to this project, this is the tonnage. And so there's actually you know 7,000 tons of material verified by way ticket that they have to submit in order to even get paid. So it was verified that way and actually reduced because we couldn't come up. And I can't remember the numbers because it's been a month or two ago, but I, there was a reduction by the contractor saying, you know, I understand it shouldn't be this much, but I honestly can justify that it's all here and here's all the way tickets that we have. And so I don't think we, in the unit price bid, we don't really have a lot of recourse either. It's really difficult to, I guess, go otherwise. It's not a, it's not a set bid price. So. It saves you, but it also, Save, saves you in a lot of situations, but it also is very complicated. Yeah, if they don't put in as much, then you get a savings, but if they put in more sometimes. And so it's just a matter of trying to watch it. This is one of the items that I I really don't have an explanation for. It's a, it's a, it, but at the same time, I have verified that the material that they brought on is there, so. Talk about the park, go back to the last slide there. Talk about the parking pack fees, why they were used for this, and then the monies that were no use have that were also used for this. Yeah, initially the, the funding for the project was from the sale of Battle Creek Park. We had a little bit of uh, over $400,000 from that. We went to this project, the balance of that was uh, park impact fees that um, are allocated and uh, can be used for uh, projects of this area. Any other questions? <laughs> well, I'm just looking at, I'm trying to understand all the proposed change orders that are in here that are itemized. Huh? Did those add up to what we're looking at here? Yes. Okay. So we, we picked out the big ones, I think, to kind of explain those. There are some smaller quantity amounts. And there's, uh, there's some uh, changes in engineering, too, uh, based on uh, additional engineering work. It adds up quick, doesn't it? Really fast. Sure small, does. Small amounts that end up becoming a large amount. On a project like this, I think in, in hindsight, um, if we were to do the unit price again, we probably would build a contingency into it so that we have that money budgeted up front. We'd probably build in a 10%. Is, is 10% reasonable? Is that a reasonable? Is that what you do on the list? Generally. It's pretty, pretty standard at 10%. Now, it, it really depends on the type of project. And I think you'll see that maybe coming in the future. You know, we may, if we develop the springs, for example, up at Battle Creek, um, which will be something that we're looking at, there's a lot of unknowns, what's buried in the mountains, how big we need to go. And so we'll want to build in some contingency to allow us to be able to get as much water and develop it as possible. That's an example of Hey, having a little bit of extra contingency in there, we might need 20% contingency or 15% contingency based on our projected, you know, if we had to dig a little bit further to develop as well. So that so kind of depends on the project. For most projects, I would say a 10% is um, just right. For You've got a set bid price. It's just the minor changes that you do throughout the construction that potentially could change that. Are paid for parking fee. There is money to cover that, and we're good. We're yeah, good in our with that fund. in our parking fee impact fee fund balance, we have about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in there right now. After this, no, I that, mean like uh, yeah, we would take one hundred and fifty out of that seven fifty, <coughs> um, which does leave money for uh, you know a couple other parks project projects that are on there. And I think I think everybody understands park impact fees. They're they're collected through development. They are earmarked. To, According to state law, specifically for park expenditures, and that's for new growth in parks. It's correct? for new growth. We can't use it for park maintenance. We can't use it for any other Roads, general fund safety. expense. Okay, um, yeah. It's for new facilities. And so land, this was land purchase. What's that? Land purchase. You, you can do land purchase with them for future facilities. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And Scott, talking with Denise, I think there was some question a, a little bit on that. Are you good. good with the 750? Yeah. Okay. I think we're still trying to figure this out a little bit. That's just part of our transition. Yeah. Our time is. <laughs> so where do we actually see the change orders that were given? The dollar amounts that are listed there as summary. <laughs> Is as far as this hundred and fifty thousand? <coughs> is that the question you're asking? The hundred and fifty two ninety three overage. Okay. The total project of one point seven two. So if you remember, the original bid amount for this project was one million four hundred and thirty nine thousand dollars. So one million four hundred forty thousand. Then there was an estimated um, engineering cost for both design and construction put on top of that that gave us this budget amount, which was in the budget of 1570000 You won't see that. All you're looking at today is the contractor's budget. It has nothing to do with the engineering budget. Um, it's only what the contractor bid, built, and billed for. And so this 150000 includes all of the change order items plus the increased engineering costs. Um, that were incurred during the construction of the project. So it's not part of the contractors? No, no. And that's, our, that's our separate contract with JUB as they do. And again, there was not a set price. It was based on a time and materials um, budget, I guess, amount that was anticipated there. So, but that 150000 you won't see that because I added <clears throat> that's both engineering and the change order amounts for the entire project. So there was a previous change order, if you remember, Mayor, for back in probably May or June for $6,500. That's in that $150,000 as well. So that's just the total increase on the project. I can get into any level of detail that you need on you that. You can get into far more levels of detail than I can, and that's why I'm just trying to yeah. look at numbers that are here. Numbers that are here yeah. and see, you know, we have the information in front of us that we're actually doing. I could show you, well, what you're approving is what the contractor was, has built, and what the changes are on the project. So, change order number two is the first thing. All of the additionals that you can see there on your sheet for change order number two. Well, and change order number two was one hundred and ten thousand dollars. One hundred and four. One hundred and four. And so, if you look at the the one fifty, is just the overall. We we wanted to show you the overall um, additional uh, change order cost, including engineering. What's in front of you for the approval is just the change order for the contract. One hundred and four thousand. I understand what you're saying. Where does it say that on here? Well, I think what you don't have in your packet might be the engineering number. Is so right? what, I'm, what I'm being asked to sign if the council approves it. So that's a pay request. Okay. So we have a change order. So this is a pay request. The change order is what we're Okay. This is the change order. This is the amount that's being increased. So this was the original amount. That's change order number one. That's the new amount. And then this is being increased by that. So there's the total amount that's being approved for the project. So they started here. This is the end. It does not relate again to this at all. Okay. I just wanted to show you the budget. I know I hate to ask these questions. I'm no, sorry, it's great. But we, we go through these numbers and yet what we're going to prove or not. What we're being it's I, just I think what you don't have in your package is the additional engineering costs, which we put into this to show you the overall picture. Okay. But the engineering is a separate cost from the final payment request and the change order that you have in front of you. So then what, what is the council being asked to approve tonight? Change order. order number two and pay request number eight. In the amount of? So change order number two and pay request number eight. I think that's 72000 if you look at the pay request. So 
So this increases what you're approving. One hundred five thousand three hundred thirty three hundred and sixty six dollars. This is the final payment, and that is the total amount that needs to be paid to that. That would pay everything through this and what they're currently owed. What they're currently owed right now is seventy-two thousand seven hundred and ninety-eight and thirty-seven of the retainage and seventy thousand seven hundred and thirty-three thousand. Okay. Any questions for Marty? <laughs> So we're contractually obligated to make these payments, and this is what we owe based on the changes of the Completed work. Yes. Yes. <coughs> By the way, what anything left when this is all said and done? Like I said, the only thing is we've got to get record drawings from the engineers. So they are making the final record drawings, but the contractor, he is done with the project. There's a one-year warranty period. Do we hold that bond for a year? So he has a surety bond that is for one year uh, on the project. So and that includes uh, any failure. So at one year, we will go back and review if there's a settled portion or if we have uh, malfunctioning heads or the lights don't work or things like that. Then he would have to come back and fix those at his cost. Warranty. If he doesn't, do that, then we can call on the bond to get the work. <coughs> is that called retainage? No, the retainage is only during the construction, and that's 5%. And that's that pay request releases the entire retainage on the project. That's $76,000. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is one that we have open for public uh, input if, um, if you want. It's a public hearing, or just no, it's not. It's public, public comment, comment allowed. Public allowed if needed. I'm never averse to hearing from the public, so I'm fine with that. If others are interested, Wayne Thatcher, 120 North, 1400 East. Uh, First question I guess I have for Marty is I'm assuming to release that retainage, we have done all the proper inspections and we are com comfortable that all the work is completed, but there is probably nothing that we would need to hold that retainage for. That is correct. Okay. The only other question I have is why do two softball fields in a parking lot cost $1.7 million? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Blake. Anyone else? Yes. No. Okay. We'll bring it back up here. Any further discussion? I think on another night it might be worth having a discussion about how to avoid whatever we can in terms of change orders and future projects like this. I don't like getting close to the ten percent that we see as the outside maximum. Um, I don't think there's time to have that discussion tonight. Well, I think maybe you can talk about sure. As far as <laughs> any, like projects, right? How many typically change orders are you in the process like this? Mm -hmm. this, is, this isn't uncommon. I would say that this is on the upper end of what we standardly see. We'd usually like to see it in the 5% or, or less. This is a little bit more. There were a lot of complications as we went through. The, uh, the road base was an unexpected, you know, $30,000, just one shot there. $20,000 in soft spot repairs, you know, right there. Those are things that you can't know as you start on the onset so you got fifty thousand dollars right there of the hundred and eleven thousand dollars of change orders in just two small little items um there were a number of things that we did if, if you look at this you know this area over here ended up being <coughs> rated out and we brought in some nice material so the rodeo grounds could operate and park on it instead of just being a mud hole those items are all in this change order to make this what it was um, so I would say that typically we wouldn't see this high of a change. I think some of the complexities of dealing with the rodeo at the same time we were constructing and getting that done added some to it. And then the complexity of hitting the pipe, soft spots, road base additions, and, and uh, addition of the, the 
cross gutter that needed to be there. You know, those types of things just made it get where it's at. Again, if, if we were talking 20% or something like that, we'd probably be way out of the line here, but um, 10 percent is on the upper end of what we like to see, but that's where we're with this one. So. so if someone has questions about why it costs 1.7 million, they can come and see you. It's public information, public record. Maybe we sure. have accounted for every dollar of the project, and so that's should be a Sure. be happy to talk with them about how the cost of all the items that you have in front of you, I mean, it's all there. It, it is, uh, for example, we, we extended a fence here. We didn't do a fence there. Those types of things are some of the items that are there that you'll see the pluses and minuses from. So I'm happy to talk with so anybody about it. Information and, the, and the rodeo ground was benefited from some of that. There was definite benefits from the rodeo, to the rodeo ground for this parking area that was uh, kind of graded out and, and given some material that we brought in and, and leveled out. Um, and right, we, by the way, the rodeo parked more people this year. And you can still, I don't know if you can see it here, but there's, you know, the layout here that Dion did. You can kind of see the lines in the sand there. You know, we, we did kind of lay it out for all of the trailers and trucks to come in there. Um, I think the material, so we added, you know, one big part of the project was that we brought in that amended topsoil to try to stabilize that so we can park on it for, um, for strawberry days. And uh, it held up well. Were you happy with it, Dion? At the end, it didn't track a lot. We didn't see a lot of deep rutting. Um, you know, there may still be some concerns with horses on the grass, those types of things that we'll have to deal with. But as far as operating the way we expected it, it, it worked. And then I guess it's still to be seen how it operates with the grass. But at least the sub base and the stuff that we expect, you know, we spent extra money to get that right. And it seems to have held up really well uh, during the rodeo season. How did you get rid of all the horse rodeo man leftovers? <laughs> so when I drove past there, there, there was a lot of so, in the world, there was a lot of stuff left on that hill. <laughs> Old fashioned way. And and I think one thing to be said is. And I think this is a great amenity if we, you know, at some point want to do a ribbon cutting on the park. Uh, um, I think it'd be a great thing. I think they're starting to play in the spring. I think we're scheduling it. Just put yeah, so all of our softball team, I would be playing this morning. So we know we'll have the baseball and diamond softball and then we'll have the softball. I've seen people playing there already.
council meeting. We're going to start with the discussion of the November 17th uh, meeting. Is that from line? Nobody's going to mess up over here. I don't believe it. What's the question? Does it have peppermint? No. On guard? Okay. No, it's one of the new motions. Okay. All right. So, um, City Council, City Board Sessions, Presentations 9A, uh, Public Hearing and Consider for Adoption Ordinance 2015-46, proposed text amendment regarding accessory permits creating city codes. <coughs> Section 10.15.47 and amending sections 10.62, definitions 9.8, 9 9 9.8, 9. Not that. Yeah, all <laughs> of the rest of the things that are listed down here. Okay? Yeah. This is the okay. culmination? This, hopefully, yes, is the culmination of 15 years of work trying to get to this point. Um, uh, nine of which I've been involved with. No more You've than been that. Here nine years. <coughs> Yeah, but then there was that one year that I wasn't here. I was with JUB, and I was on the committee here. So, yeah, so let's make it 10. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think we finally uh, have come to a good spot now. Uh, this has been vetted and reviewed several times and come before Planning Commission uh, previously, and it is going to the Planning Commission this Thursday night in a public hearing. We have prepared, uh, well, we've got a plan to have uh, extra seats set up into the old rec center in case there's not enough room here for the crowd <coughs> to show up. Um, we're not sure yet what we might do on Tuesday if, if Thursday, this Thursday's meeting is just overflowing and we have to do that because we have a difficulty of using the old rec center on Tuesday night because of the, uh, the boutique. Uh, <coughs> Holy cow, but uh, we'll be setting up and such. So we'll have to find another location if we need to, perhaps the fire station bays or something if we need to do that. I'm hoping, well, we'll see, that we'll be able to take the crowd in this room, but uh, we'll have to make a plan for it, uh, if not. Um, so anyway, uh, we, uh, we hope that the answers will be there and that the city is ready to take this step. I think it's needed, it's well past due. So this addresses all those concerns that we've gone over, everything that we've reconciled the last time we discussed it. Yes. And that's basically what's coming back. Any surprises me? Nope. Nope, okay. Any questions for Ken? Thank you, it's a lot of good work. Okay. Uh, <coughs> That's it for section nine, section 10. Action items ready for vote. Consider for adoption resolution 2015-038 authorizing the mayor and municipal council sitting as board of canvassers to accept election returns and declaring certified, certifying the results of the general election held on November 3rd. Kathy? I, I, I wanna move that to the first, because I think I get to we're coming down that line. <coughs> I mean, the accessory permit might take quite a long time. Oh, probably could. Do so, you want to do that? Move it that. to the uh, above nine. Okay. And I, I guess I had a question, and I've been afraid to ask it to show my ignorance. What exactly did not get counted that will be included in this next result? All the provisional location ballots. When you vote provisionally, the county has to. So it's whoever showed up to vote, if there was a problem, they let them vote. They were not registered. They don't show up as registered. Sometimes they were just not known. It was an address problem or name change or that kind of stuff. So anything that kind of calls it into question. If somebody comes in and, you know, I voted at this place for 20 days, I'm not going to go over there. So they took a bit. Yeah. And then those yeah. all get counted by hand. Right. And verified with where they're doing it. Yeah. 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 And then the absentee ballots so that go <coughs> in for the postmark November 10th. So as long as they were postmarked before the uh, election date, then they get counted. Mm -hmm. Any, anything else? Just I those two? And do you have an idea of what kind of numbers we're looking at? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Okay. 
So this one is all every day. Okay. Well, wait, how many do we have in the primary? Ninety seven. We had ninety two. So that, that might give you a ball. Total of twelve. Yeah. Provisional. So I guess the provisional. I'm not sure how many. Out of fifteen. Thanks. We'll have something around there, maybe a little bit more. Okay. Uh, so maybe what we'll do, if it's okay, we'll just keep it as 10A, but the council can change the, because to put it under action item for public discussion, we can put it under there, I guess. We'll just keep it there. It's on five. What's that? It's on five. A whole new category of the results. Okay. Okay. We'll take care of it. All right, 10B, consider a request by Murphy's Oil Express for site plan of for a 1,200 square foot convenience store with an eight pump fuel station operated 24 uh, seven, beer, tobacco um, property located at 1679 West State. I thought it was another oil business. <laughs> Not related to doTERRA, no. <laughs> so this is in front of Walmart, so it'll be a fuel station, a gas station, and a convenience store. Then. So the convenience store is small in size. It's mostly a fuel station. And then questions go. 1679 West State. Yeah, yeah the, the developer that brought in Walmart just is bringing this up. <coughs> Any further discussion? I got a quick question about that one. Is there a reason in the notice that we have to mention the beer and tobacco separately? Is that a legal requirement that we identify that they're selling tobacco and alcohol? I don't know that it's legal. I think it was just trying to yeah, be transparent about what the business was. They're going to have to come in for a beer license. That'll be a separate action that we'll do. Anyone else? All right, 10C, consider for adoption resolution 2015-039, authorizing the mayor to sign a land lease agreement with Verizon Wireless. This is what we discussed. We've been working on this for several months, I believe we're close. They have the uh, land lease agreement, they're attorney, they're reviewing it. I have not gotten any comments back yet, but I've been working with um, their representative to keep signing, and he knows that there's a deadline, and if he doesn't make it, he won't be able to have it. So that's why I'm working on that. They're working out details with um, T-Mobile as well for co-location and some of the fiber conduits leading out to their new tower. So you're saying there's a possibility this might get continued? It might. They don't get their stuff. <coughs> He's been working diligently on it. It was supposed to be on last week's or on tonight's agenda, and he wasn't ready, and so we had to get him up to speed with it. But I, I think there's a 95 percent chance that he's done. All right. Thank you. Uh, item 11A is a three-year coordinated road maintenance plan. Uh, I think this is the big one. Ready to go. Okay. So. It'll be discussion. Yeah, one of the things that I'm a little bit concerned about is we, we did make a request from all the utility agencies to give us that. And most of them responded in, <coughs> they just said, we don't know. You know, right now, we don't have any projected request our gas, for example. We don't have any planned projects in the next five years in the community, but it's based on demand. If, if the development comes in and you're outside the line, then you can do that. And so we'll have to. Kind of take that and every year as we update that plan we'll have to still make that request maybe have a meeting with all the utility companies and give them another chance to hey what's coming up this year to make sure we haven't missed something but uh, so i think that's one of the things i think it, it just needs to be a little bit flexible but we'll be ready to show you what our recommendations are based on the budget based on what we think we should spend over the next three years and then that'll be updated as we as we go forward every year does this include the lewis and young study no when will that be completed that's almost done. We met with them today. Um, I'm Over guessing, lunch. Yes. They right. took us to lunch after we met with them. By the end of the year. Um, uh, possibly in December. Yeah. Uh, more early January. So, uh, so we definitely want to get that one going and get them going. Okay. Uh, 
Anything else, Mark? Then we move on to discuss <coughs> the following year or the following week's uh, council meeting. I guess that's not the following week. That is two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks after the the Tuesday okay. after that is Thanksgiving. Tuesday. Right. Okay. Neighborhood and staff business. Uh, Libby, new staff. Nope. Mm -hmm. So. I just want to say I've been involved for 20 plus years and I think our city is in a really good shape considering where it had been. And I know we worked hard week after week after week to get the budget in a good place. We have good directors, good staff. I've sat through <coughs> council meetings. I can count on my hand what I've missed. You're a good council. Thanks, Libby. That's Thanks, really Libby. Sweet. Appreciate that. We can applaud her. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else want to come? <laughs> <laughs> something and they don't say anything then I look like the bad guy especially when it's rolling up the tent. <laughs> is that his sexy voice? Or yeah. Yeah, radio voice. <laughs> don't say the word sexy. Yeah. <laughs> Curves. Well, I just want to say <laughs> Marty and his crew <coughs> working in on the sewer out there and he was he was taking that seemed weird because the mic got the benefit. Mm -hmm. They were going they would ran a, they ran a ranch over the station. We have had a sewer problem since day one. And if we were trying to unplug a sink somewhere, we were running water on the floor. Um, in the kitchen and the out floor, and so it's just been a mess. And there just was no easy fix. And so his crew actually brought in, they stubbed the line in to an existing tunnel that was there and, and allowed us to hook our kitchen and our, our clothes washers and stuff to that line. And it's, I've got a time for it for the first time since I came here. So uh, there may have been a little added expense to that, um, but it was well worth it. And even though we know the building may go away at some point, still we're a couple of years away from that. And we don't have to deal with it. Plugged up sink all the time and having dirty water on the roof. It's very nice. <laughs> I thought my job was hazardous. <laughs> I don't see any facial hair. No, some of us can't grow it. I did this summer and it was a mistake. I mean, nobody liked it. So. <laughs> I'm doing okay to you. <laughs> She's going to go wax after this. <laughs> Uh, 
Anything else? Yeah, we're going to need that. Sorry, Jeff. As long as we're talking uh, internships, um, we have a very unofficial one happening here in community development. Some of you know that we've had Jennifer uh, as volunteered to help us with scanning of her documents, so files that are way backed up as far as electronic files. And she's she's offering her time for free, and uh, we really appreciate her. Oh, that's great. great. <laughs> With Dion, Bike Park, when's all that happening? Can we have a house next Thursday? A week from next Thursday? It has that been after, like, on the city website and everything? Yeah. It will be after this month. It will be this week. It's like a slider on the homepage or something? I guess that one. I think there's a slider, but. And then, like, on the city Facebook page and whatnot. Where will it be held at the new rec center? Or not? Actually, it's here. Oh, it's here? Okay. So, and then uh, planning commission is, I believe, the 10th, and then the next one is the 14th. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Diana? No. Nothing? Are you sure? I can type in when I want to. <laughs> um, I wanted to pay compliments to Marty and Scott. Uh, this weekend I was doing fielding phone calls when a water main broke, and uh, a number of houses were shut off the water, and I just thought it was incredibly valuable to have good people responsive and available on a Sunday night. Appreciated that. Uh, and I had a suggestion on the front of uh, I don't know how well our Everbridge system is incorporated across departments, but it might be nice <coughs> to have when water lines are getting shut down to do repairs to uh, make sure people are getting an affirmative notice of that kind of work. So. The extent that we can coordinate that, I mean, the Everbridge, I've gotten notices about these pictures. It would be nice to get the public a notice about water mains, but, but I truly appreciated the responsiveness and the assistance on the Sunday night. So, when my water was shut off, I got a notice. Yeah, well, this is an emergency. This was, a, this was a water line break. That's because you didn't pay your bill. Ben, Ben, can I just say, um, when, when the text came through and I got a hold of Marty, Greg Woodcox was already on scene taking care of it. So, you know, the uh, you know Greg's responsible for um, our water system, and these guys have done a ton of these things, and um, they are they are good at just getting in. And they they did one in my neighborhood one time. It was I think about eleven thirty at night, and they worked uh, all through the night to get it taken care of. And so that they, they do a great job. But um, I think all Marty and I did was. Eventually get a hold of Greg <laughs> and find out what was going on, but they were they were already yeah. so so we have somebody that's always on call for one to one. We always have somebody and if they need to have needs uh, greater than something they can't do, they'll call out additional personnel to get over there and get things fixed. And so we actually had three other guys called out. Uh, we had one guy on duty and uh, on call and we had to call out three others to get that one fixed with a big leak. So you may want to consider that. I think they're, you know, we're getting the notice from the police department from, from dispatch a lot of times that, hey, there's a problem. You know, there may be a way to kind of just recount back real quick. This is where the leak's at, and you may be affected. I think we'll have a really good <coughs> like, clarifying who's going to be affected because it just depends. Sometimes we'll have a valve that won't shut, and we have to go up to the next block and shut that off so it shuts off a whole other block. And by the time we get that, we're halfway through picking it out, fixing it, getting it put back together. So some of that wouldn't work, but we could probably just identify there's an issue in this area. If you're having water problems, it's due to this leak at this location, and uh, and we'll be fixed as soon as possible type of a thing. But not specific to any this neighborhood will be out because that really depends on how we are able to isolate the leak. Makes sense. Marty, is there <coughs> is there more leaks during the cold weather? I don't know. Okay. I don't. I don't think there's anything that would, you know, all of our lines are very major now. It's not from the freezing generally, but you can have it's leaks. You know, more so the surface is water aging and too shallow type of things. So I'd say maybe yes, but mainline leaks that hopefully they're deep enough. We're not being affected by the cold weather. They're below the frost line. 
it was, it was a massive, right? Marty was showing me a picture. It was pretty impressive to see. Thanks. Again, I didn't have Greg's number handy, so I was grateful that there were people that could help me figure out what to tell people that were calling. Okay. Anything? Okay. There you go. Very high priority. Um, my curbside recycling wasn't picked up on the board. And I'm looking at the calendar here. It says south area and south area two times in a row, and then north not till the 25th. Oh, but it didn't get picked up. So we didn't get picked up on the screen. Yeah, if you don't get picked up, just well, those, nowhere got picked Yeah, up. we can call into the office and then we'll call them. Okay. We'll call them and they'll, they'll come back. They'll come in. Okay. It doesn't happen very often that there are people. Okay, did everyone sign the flats? All right, looking at the calendar, it looks like tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. The city offices will be closed in honor of Veterans Day. <coughs> Um, Thanksgiving starts on the 26th. Do we know when school gets out this year? Thursday, Friday. So just, just those four. Okay. All right. What is the Thursday. Okay. Um, we're going to do the motion to go into executive session <coughs> to discuss the purchase, exchange, or lease of real property. May I'll make a motion that we go into an executive session to discuss the purchase, lease, or sale of real property. Okay. okay. Motion by Ben, second by Diana. All in favor? 